If everyone could take a moment to silence their, silence themselves. Everyone is very excited and enthusiastic about City Council tonight, and I'm glad. It's probably because it's also my birthday, and we're here to celebrate City Council and <laughs> birthday. If you could take a moment and silence your cell phones, uh, and please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have no proclamations on the, on the agenda tonight. The first item is the consent agenda. Is there any item on the consent agenda that anyone on council would like to consider separately or has a question about? This would be the time or a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, accept the uh, adopt. consent, adopt the <laughs> consent agenda. Sorry. We're a little rusty. I know. <laughs> What am I to say? <laughs> All right, we have a motion to adopt the consent agenda by Gwen and a second, VJ. And Maggie is leaving now. Okay. Are <laughs> she we says good? Jamie to go get something. Maybe if we could go to the next one. There she is. Oh, there she is. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right, any questions or comments from council? All right. Is there anyone wishing to comment on the motion to adopt the consent agenda? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We have two presentations tonight. The first is an update on the Asheville Police Department's open data uh, program project. Project. Uh, sure. I don't know what to call it. And Jamie Matthews is here to yeah. talk to us about. It. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm here again to give you guys an update on where we are with the a releasing APD open data and other requested information. Um, again, here is a review of the goals for this project, just as a reminder. Um, and a list as an overview of the request. Um, since our last update, staff has continued to work on releasing the data sets and this requested information while providing updates and working with our community partners. The blue check marks here indicate items that are complete uh, and at today's meeting of the governance committee they discussed the recordings of committee meetings and those are going to start within the next three months. Um, so we've experienced a few technical delays with some of the other data sets that we're continuing to work through. Um, APD has completed a needed update to their software um, that keeps their use of force and citizen complaint data. Uh, and APD will continue to work with that vendor um, to pull the data for first view before we can post it on uh, the open data site. Uh, emergency calls and citations and arrests. Our IT department is working with the county to release that. Uh, there's been some delays um, because there's been some turnover at the county uh, in their IT department. So we're going to continue to keep uh, our community partners and you guys updated on that progress. And HR is continuing to work on how to release the demographic, uh, demographic data. So in addition to working on the data sets, APD has posted um, policies and reports to their website and they've added a link that's directly on that landing page for APD that makes it easier to find all of this in one place so you're not digging through uh, the APD website to try and find it. And they're working on getting all the policies and reports posted um, that are public record. So that's, that's our update for now. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Okay, thanks. Um, the second presentation tonight is a Council Strategic Operating Plan update from Peggy Rowe, Interim City Manager, Assistant City Manager. Assistant. 
<laughs> Pardon me. I have to keep all these titles straight. So Good yeah. evening, Mayor, members of Council. Peggy Rowe, Interim Assistant City Manager. And I'm pleased to be here to give you a brief update on the status of your strategic operating plan. First, equity and diverse community. Excuse me. The equity action plan was adopted June 19, 2018 for implementation in FY19. The plan aims to establish racial equity as a key value by developing a shared understanding of key concepts across the entire jurisdiction and create a sense of, un of urgency to make the changes necessary. We intend to build staff and organizational capacity, skills and competencies through training while also building an infrastructure to support the work and implement new tools for decision making, measurement and accountability. The city is working to improve workforce equity aimed at eliminating racial disparities in hiring and promotions and improving retention rates. We aim to see demographics of people of color grow and unemployment wage disparities decrease between black and white populations. In the FY 2018, 200 employees were hired by the city, 13% of which were people of color. We are working to provide better income opportunities for minority-owned businesses through community outreach and better data collection and research. Citywide outreach and public engagement interdepartmental teams have been put together for a more inclusive community. A well-planned and livable community. The Capital Projects Division is excited to be making progress on the construction of the Riverfront Greenway. Some setbacks occurred earlier in the year as a result of unfavorable, unfavorable wet weather conditions. But despite this, a large section of Greenway has been constructed, as well as several parking lots along the riverfront that are now open for public use. Temporary activities continue at Haywood Street property, including use as a community garden and for outdoor special events. A temporary art installation is planned for this summer, which will include the work of local designers in a mural project. An interview team consisting of city staff and some members of the public made a recommendation for a consultant. However, funding has not yet been identified. The PED committee, <coughs> excuse me, instructed staff to come back this fall to, per, to discuss the project and determine if funding is available. In July 2018, a groundbreaking ceremony was held in Montford to begin construction on the Recreation Center and 17-acre park to include improvements on the playground and the parking. The project also involves the addition of new recreational space and walkways connecting park features. The project is expected to be completed in the fall. A clean and healthy environment. Tonight, Council voted on the Renewable Energy Planning Services request for proposal. This initiative explores what it would take to transition the city and county to renewable energy to, to encourage a clean energy future. The RFP also seeks to reveal how a partnership with the county can be used to fulfill the municipal carbon reduction and renewable energy goals of the city and the county. We've completed the community clean energy policy framework to reduce the dependence on fossil fuels. In addition, Duke Energy has agreed to a partnership with the city of Asheville and Buncombe County to reduce energy use in order to delay, to delay or avoid construction of a third plant in 2023. LED lighting conversions have been made across the city, increasing our reduction in energy use and carbon emission. Four energy audits were conducted on energy intensive buildings. The city's climate resiliency assessment was completed in the spring and was adopted as an appendix to the comprehensive plan in June. Efforts are currently underway to develop a toolkit to help residents build resilience on their own property. We contracted with Asheville Greenworks to conduct five free composting workshops around the city. We revised the food policy to prioritize growing more food in the city and developing metrics to, to track the progress and impact. As a result of these many changes across the city, we've achieved 31% of the 80% carbon reduction goal. Quality affordable housing. Recent redevelopment of city-owned land is gaining ground. With the near completion of Eagle Marketplace Apartments downtown, 
which will offer 62 affordable workforce apartments and mixed-use buildings. The project is expected to reach completion later this year. The South Slope Vision Plan includes a number of projects, including the restructuring of Lee Walker Heights to include 20, excuse me, 212 mixed income affordable housing options. Site work is set to begin early 2019. The city is also taking a closer look at connection for cars, pedestrians, and bikers in the area. The city purchased 3.7 acres located at Oak Hill Drive and New Leicester Highway for the future development of affordable housing. Transportation and accessibility. The draft final transit master plan is now available for review. The plan has been endorsed by Transit Committee and Multimodal Transportation Commission and was reviewed by the PED Committee. Later on the agenda tonight, the City Council will have final review. Highlights of the transit master plan include, number one, increasing service frequency to 30 minutes on most routes, 15 minutes combined frequency on primary corridors. Number two, increasing the span of service later into the evening. Number three, expanding mobility options and reducing the dependence on transfers by creating new crosstown routes, interlining routes, so that passengers have the option of a single seat ride without switching buses. Number four, expand service to new areas of the city and county which are not currently within existing service area. The City of Asheville with federal grant assistance through the French Broad River MPO has commissioned Alta Planning Plus Design to evaluate the city's readiness for a bike share system and to recommend next steps to getting ready for a bike share. A public meeting was held on June 28 to allow citizens to provide feedback on the addition of a bike share system. At this time, more community engagement is needed to gain a better understanding of the community need but plans are moving forward and the final plan to be pre will be presented to council by Thanksgiving. The downtown parking plan changes are underway and include goals such as replacing existing parking meters with new smart parking meters in the central business district, about 60% complete at this time. Staff is working closely with parking subcommittee of the downtown commission. Additional goals include real-time garage parking availability for, cities, for the city's four main parking garages and the county's two parking garages shown on Asheville's web, so web pages and the Asheville app. And number two, finalize a lease agreement for monthly parking opportunities at a surface parking lot on the south slope. The city has five new electric buses on order that will be arriving January 2019 with a plan to order more over the next two fiscal years moving towards the goal of phasing out all diesel buses in the next 10 to 12 years. These, these buses are 100% battery electric and have an average fuel, e fuel economy of 28.1 miles per gallon equivalent. This is far more efficient than the current buses that get three to five miles per gallon. This will reduce our local emissions by over 1,000 pounds per bus per year and will help us meet the city's carbon reduction and climate mitigation goals. A thriving com local economy, the minority owned and section three construction firms mentoring program is drafted. The program supports small businesses as well as minority owned businesses. The program focuses on organizational development, financials, marketing resources, and mentoring groups. Asheville's business toolkit has been implement implemented especially in the River Arts District where construction along the river has posed a potential setback for business owners while they remain operational. The construction is expected to bring disruptions to the district from now until 2020. In anticipation of these disruptions, the city created a strategic plan for business vitality during construction resulting in a business toolkit of resources include branding and marketing collateral, inter and intra district signage during construction, printed resources, capacity building projects, and a $25,000 fund for support over the three year construction period. An engaged, connected and engaged community in a continuing effort to increase transparency and provide community with access to data, the Asheville Police Department has worked to release traffic data, excuse me, traffic stop data from 2006 to present. 
online through the City of Asheville Open Data Portal, as you heard about earlier. This portal offers access to APD traffic stops and crime statistics, as well as simplicity and community crime map. The newly formed Blue Ribbon Committee has created the Human Relations Commission. They have a meeting set to be held August 23rd. And finally, a financial resilient community. Standard and Poor and Moody's recently upground, upgraded our bond rating from a double A plus to triple A considering Asheville's economy strong based on its standing in a regional, as a regional center for trade, manufacturing, healthcare related services for Western North Carolina. As a result of this upgrade, the city of Asheville will be able to borrow money at a better rate than most other cities due largely to a stable financial outlook and growing, well-diversified economy coupled with strong financial management and reserves. The city debt policy requires debt service not to exceed 15% of total government operating revenue. In addition, the city is poised to retire at least 50% of its existing debt in the next 10 years, allowing the city the capacity to implement a long-term capital improvement program funded primarily by new debt. In August 2016, Council approved a general obligation bond referendum that, that would generate $74 million for public improvements financed by these bonds. This year marks the second year that these bonds are being put into use for improvements across the city. Eight projects have been completed already and 10 are under construction right now. A dashboard has been created for those that are interested to, to further look into the use of the funds for these various projects. To support and understand, to, to support an understanding of the financial obligations that each project accompanies and show the planning breakdown to ensure proper spending is applied throughout the project timeline. That concludes my presentation. Thank you all. Can I just mention a couple of other things that, um, that I think are important? <coughs> um, the, on, I think both of these go under the transportation um, category and also the livability category mm -hmm. is just that we also uh, made the decision around the Charlotte Street um, road diet, um, which is going to make a big difference for that community. Mm -hmm. um, we are still in active conversations with NCDOT about the Merriman Avenue proposal, which um, didn't which didn't sit very well with a lot of folks. Uh, and then um, we continue our diligent work with NCDOT on the I-26 project to make sure that that project you know, benefits the people who live here and not just the people who are coming through. So thank you. Thank you all. I have a, I have a question, oh. I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned that out of 200 new hires, 13% were um, people of color. Yes, Do you have the wage averages of those individuals? I do not, but I can get that for you. I'll be glad okay. to find that out. And also sure, under you know. Section 3, the construction firm mentoring program, is Kimberly Archie involved in um, the planning of that program? I believe she is, but I'll confirm that as okay. well. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, Esther, I have one more thing since yes. we're on transport, since I was, since I like transportation. Um, you mentioned the parking garages, and I just want to make sure that everybody knows that the county parking garages are now linked on the Asheville app, so that when you're looking for parking downtown, you can also see what's available in the county decks. Um, I, on a couple of different uh, random Friday and Saturday nights over the last month, I have I've pulled that up. These have been beautiful Saturday nights in downtown Asheville, and there have been um, over a thousand empty parking spaces in all of our decks combined. So, let's. Um, I'm, I'm about ready to declare the parking crisis over. Uh, until those may not be parking where you want it, but there's parking. Thank you. How can that be? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of parking in downtown Asheville. Uh, Peggy already left, but I, I want to highlight another thing that's sort of slowly, it's been such a slow process, it's hard to put your finger on it, but, um, you know, Duke Energy started years ago trying to locate three substations in the downtown area, new substations, um, and they, they actually purchased three sites, and immediately we realized those three sites would not work. And so they have worked with the community, and I really want to thank them. Uh, for working with the community to find new sites and the first one that it's, and it will come to council for review but the first one is uh, the old Volvo dealership on Patton Avenue 
And I think the initial reaction to a lot of people was, hey, we don't want a giant substation when you drive into downtown Asheville. So uh, through a lot of community work um, and urging from the city and, and work on behalf of the city as well, a lot of our staff have been heavily involved. Duke is gonna build the second ever um, GIS substation, which is a, um, help me, what does it stand for? Gas insulated. Gas insulated substation. So the, the good thing about a gas insulated substation, well, first let me just say the bad thing is they cost a couple million dollars more. Um, but the good thing is that they take up a significantly smaller footprint and you can enclose them fully in a building. So, um, so Duke, Duke will come to us for review of that project and has worked again really hard with, uh, with the neighborhood. So, um, that 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 uh, that is a major a major effort that's just continuing to happen, and a lot of people have been involved. So I want to thank everyone who's been uh, involved in that project. So late, stay tuned. We'll see we'll see renderings of that design and the product that that's produced uh, later later on. Maybe I don't know if it'll be ready for August or not. I'm looking at Shannon. She's shaking her head. No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else want to add anything? Okay, as long as we're on it. Okay. <clears throat> I feel like Maggie was glaring at Peggy for going over 10 minutes. Was that over 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. All right. So uh, we now are into the public hearing section of our agenda. The first item is a public hearing authorizing an economic development incentive grant to General Electric Corporation and Unison Engine Components, Inc. I assume Sam is doing this. Oh, yeah. I've got you on my Sam Powers is here to present this item to us. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. I'm Sam Powers, Community and Economic Development Director. And I just realized this is my first council appearance with glasses. And so looking we up and down is a, is a challenge <laughs> that I had not anticipated. So you're going to have to bear with me just a little bit. Um, the, the, tonight's consideration is approval of a resolution authorizing a performance-based economic development incentive grant with GE uh, Corporation and Unison Engine uh, Components Incorporated. As council may recall, back on March 1st, Governor Cooper was in Asheville to make uh, a major announcement about this project, and so we've been moving uh, towards today and this public hearing since then. Uh, in terms of review, uh, this is a request uh, that uh, came from the Economic Development Coalition of Asheville Buncombe County for a performance-based grant under the city's Economic Development Incentive Program uh, for an existing Asheville manufacturing facility operated by General Electric Corporation and Unison Engine Components Incorporated. The purpose of the city's participation in this grant would be to induce GE to make additional investments in the city of Asheville for the uh, expenditures to acquire and install machinery and equipment, make facility improvements, uh, which would increase the ad valorem tax uh, in the city as determined by the Buncombe County Tax Department in the amount of $105 million and create 131 new jobs with a median wage of $49,500. All new jobs will pay a living wage and are fully benefited. The city is considering a performance-based grant in an amount not to exceed $900,960. North Carolina state law requires a public hearing be held before an incentive grant can be awarded. The incentive grant for GE Unison supports the City Council's strategic operating plan as it addresses multiple uh, uh, components of a thriving local economy. The pros for this are that is again a performance driven grant that is distributed only after job and investment is achieved or mutually agreed upon performance benchmark, benchmarks are achieved. The grant is based on new ad valorem tax revenue in the city of Asheville. The grant supports the expansion of an existing industry in the city of Asheville and it supports regional and state cooperation and economic development. The con in this project, the grant is formulated based on use of a portion, in this case 50%, of the new incremental increase from property tax revenue generated by the project for a five-year period. The physical impact for the project is an overall positive physical impact 
on tax revenues received by the city. Initially, during the grant period, the city will receive 50% of the new incremental property tax revenues, as well as the existing property tax revenues from the project. After the grant period of five years, the city will henceforth receive and capture 100% of all city taxes. Staff projects that the first payment of the grant uh, in the potential range of $175,000, again, uh, based on performance, would be budgeted and paid for most likely in the 2021 budget year. Staff's recommendation is that City Council uh, approve a resolution authorizing a performance-based grant uh, to support retention and expansion of General Electric Corporation and Unison Engine components. Um, Michael McGuire, who is the plant manager for GE Aviation here in Asheville, is here tonight. He can make some brief comments about the project and about GE Aviation's presence in Asheville. And of course, I'll be available to answer any questions have uh, that council have after the public hearing. Okay, Sam, I just got to say you did Southern for fiscal. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I'm from the physical, South. Physical, <laughs> fiscal, fiscal, fiscal. Yes. We got, we, so I would, I think we would love to hear from GE. I, this is the moment, we haven't done one of these in a little while. It's been but, a while. Yeah, I always like to take this moment and explain, because you did it, but you used all the lingo. When we, we call these incentive grants, and I don't really know exactly why they're called incentive grants. I really think it's better to refer to them as a rebate. So companies that make investments in Asheville and grow their footprint by investing dollars in building buildings and filling it full of equipment and hiring people have to pay more property taxes. And this, the way this works is to the extent they grow how much property tax they have to pay the city, they can be eligible to receive a portion of that back over a period of time to, as our grant uh, to them to incentivize them to make this investment. So we don't get out the checkbook and write a check for $900,000. That is not how it works. But as they build it and produce more revenue, they get a chance to get some of that revenue back over a period of time. So I just always like to make that clear because incentive grants can be sometimes pretty controversial and people don't really understand how they function or why a city would make, make the investment. But from the city's perspective, that's how they work. Now it's different for the county and for the state. This is a super exciting one. So let's hear from the company about this project. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, I appreciate it. Um, just a little bit about GE Aviation and what we do here in Asheville. But we are, uh, have been around for a long time, actually since the late 40s. Uh, this particular site uh, has continued to see growth year over year over year, um, especially back in 2014, 2013 timeframe when we broke ground on a new technology that our business has invested in. It's called ceramic matrix composites. And it goes on one of our newest LEAP engines that is our growth platform for all of GE Aviation as well as our GE9X. So we're actually here locally in Asheville, North Carolina, are producing one of the only uh, components in aviation history on uh, this new material. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, the technology is, is groundbreaking. Um, and performs like no other material system we've ever had before. So uh, that's great news. Our legacy business is also continuing to grow. Um, as we talked about, the commitment is across the board, um, 131 additional incremental jobs from where we were um, earlier this year. That'll grow our total employee base to, what is that, uh, 550 employees roughly. Uh, if my, my math is right, and then an incremental 105 capital, uh, 105 million of capital investment, and that's on top of 126 million in which we invested uh, back in 2014. So our business continues to do very well. GE Aviation is the cornerstone of the GE Corporation as a whole, and um, our current backlog is is upwards of 170 billion dollars across GE Aviation. So the fact that we're, the, the corporation is investing in Asheville, North Carolina speaks volumes to the type of technical talent we're able to recruit locally and uh, just the, the great partnership we have with city, council, local business community. Uh, it's the right type of technology and growth uh, that we want to see in, in Asheville. So. 
It, it's been exciting to see you already able to build on the investment you yeah. made back in 2014. Um, and I, I especially am a fan of your program to teach high school students how to Absolutely. eventually become uh, employees in your in your uh, in your company. Um, and I was listening on the news recently. They were talking about this piece of GE really being the strength of the company right now. So yeah, there, like there's there's lots of you know tough press at the corporation level um, where they are spinning a lot of our sub businesses off but the core of, of GE is going to be long term our GE power, GE renewables and then GE aviation is aviation is really at the core. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I just want to make a comment and yes as the mayor said it, it, again for those of you who are, who are looking at this the, the 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 rebate if you will or grant whatever you want to call it is only distributed after the job and investment is is achieved so this is not this is a situation where um, if you don't comply with it you don't get it right uh, and so I want to make that very clear to folks you know who, who may be watching this that's also um, you know that's a that's a key component of this as it's well it's not an advance that's right that's right, right. And Mayor, I just have a question. Uh, yes. Can you talk a little bit about these the 131 jobs? What just can you tell us briefly? What kinds of jobs are they? Are these? Yeah, so it, it ranges, um, but I would say um, all of our jobs come in at an entry level, <coughs> um, which is actually a, a, a good manufacturing paying job, uh, somewhere in the $16 per hour range. In a very short period of time, and you know. Literally 24 months, they have the ability to make 20 plus dollars an hour and even grow more. Um, those are our technician jobs, and they can be anywhere from um, uh, NDE or uh, inspection tech, inspection technology uh, folks. They can be uh, m lots of different manufacturing jobs. Machinists. Um, they work in in thermal processing. They can be. Uh, in, in shipping receiving, lots of different skill sets, so we're looking for all different types mm -hmm. of skill set. And do, do most of those folks need to have a college degree or high school degree or two-year college degree right. or what kind of training? Yeah, it's a mixed bag. Um, mm -hmm. We have a partnership with AB Tech where on our composite right. side that we actually train uh, thoroughly for, for several uh, weeks and get folks are ready to come in the door where they come in they're very productive and we give them the secret sauce of our technology uh, if you would so uh, the skill set can in some cases can be very low uh, and we and we teach and train them uh, and in other cases we hire directly in the very skilled uh, machining uh, experienced folks so it really okay. ranges depending on where in the operation the, the job function is great thanks Thank you. anybody else have any questions Thank you. Thank you. Sam, unless you have anything else, I'm going to open the public hearing. Okay. So technically before council votes on an incentive grant like this, we, we need to have a public hearing. So I'm going to open the public hearing. If there's anyone who wishes to comment on this proposal, you can do so. Just give us your name and you've got three <coughs> minutes. Is there anyone wishing to comment on this item? Okay. Should I just say that? Yep. Come to the microphone. Yeah. It's official, you're on camera. We gotta get you in front of the mic. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that I support um, everything that GE is doing. I was born in North Carolina, but actually I've lived in China for the last 15 years um, because I'm an industrial designer and I can't even get a job here. I've run factories uh, in China for 15 years and even when I came back, um, I went to the AB Tech school and looked at the aerospace composites class, um, but it was canceled. Um, so anyway, I support what they're doing, but uh, I don't know if the industry uh, or the environment actually supports what they're doing. And tell it. Tell us who you are. Oh, sorry. Oh, my name's Dave Rowe. Anyone else wishing to comment on the proposal? Yes. Good evening, my name is Tiffany Debelo. And my question is, um, what is the percentage of equity or people of color that actually work within um, GE? Lo locally Aviation. or the, are you talking about the? Locally within. Okay here in Asheville. We'll have to ask you. Okay, I'm gonna to have to do a reminder about um, 
conducting yourselves in the chambers this evening. No snapping. We hit, went over that last time, so no snapping. Would, and our rule's always been no clapping. We just had to expand it a little bit. I appreciate it, thank you. Um, anyone else? We'll try to see if anybody knows the information. You asked about uh, the percentage of the workforce. And um, I, don't, I lost track of words. Oh, do you know the answer to that question? We can take. It's, it's been a couple of weeks since we reviewed those numbers. Yeah, you have to come back to that. I'd say it's 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 been a it's been a, a little while since we reviewed those numbers. Um, I would hate to give you a number that is not 100% accurate. Um, and it's something I'd like to follow up um, uh, with the council if that if that works. Okay. Is there anyone else wishing to who would who would like to speak on this item? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Do I have questions, comments, or a motion? Uh, I feel like I'll make a motion. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll make a motion that the Asheville City Council approve a resolution authorizing the performance-based economic development incentive grant uh, agreement to support retention and expansion with General Electric Corporation and Unison Engine Components. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right, uh, unless anyone has any other questions. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We have um, one other item under public hearings. And thank you for anyone who came for the GE item. Um, it is a public hearing to consider an amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance to add standards to the outdoor lighting ordinance. And Shannon Tuck is going to talk with us about this item. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Um, for more specifically, this is an amendment to Article 11 of the Unified Development Ordinance, which includes, among other things, all of the standards that regulate outdoor lighting. And to summarize, this amendment seeks to achieve three basic things. Um, first, it wants to raise the lumen levels allowed for unshielded string lights in outdoor dining areas. Secondly, to establish new and updated standards to sports courts and sports field lighting. And then lastly, to make a few minor corrections and clarifications. Um, more specifically, regarding the string lights, um, generally speaking, all lights in Asheville, outdoor lights, um, should be shielded. A very low luminosity lighting, which is defined as 15 lumens or less, is exempt in the ordinance, and they can be unshielded. Uh, there was a request from council earlier this year to allow unshielded lights that are greater than 15 lumens to accommodate outdoor dining areas, um, both for illumination but also for some nighttime ambiance. Our development services staff researched some of the common um, lights that were available in the marketplace and helped us propose a standard of 25 lumens for incandescent bulbs and 50 lumens for LED bulbs. Um, the difference between the two standards appears to be rooted in the LED technology, and it is also somewhat reflective of, of just what's available in the marketplace commonly. I um, should also point out that this higher standard that allows these unshielded string lights applies and is available only to outdoor dining areas. It doesn't apply, it doesn't open the door to have string lights, unshielded string lights elsewhere, it's just for outdoor dining. Regarding the sports court, and sports field lighting um, as part of the city's capital improvements to park facilities. It was discovered that our existing standards um, did not adequately address the unique needs of uh, nighttime uh, sports facilities. Uh, these facilities typically require much higher levels of illuminance um, for safe and effective play. And also, the, these kinds of lights cannot be shielded, at least not in the same way as decorative or other utility lights. Um, I'd also like to point out that these higher um, standards apply only to those facilities that were defined in the attached ordinance, um, which most commonly are basketball and tennis courts for the courts, and uh, for, uh, to soccer, baseball, softball, and football for the sports fields. Um, it wouldn't apply to other facilities that are ancillary to another primary use. It wouldn't apply to, to some minor recreation areas. Um, lastly, when we update an ordinance section, it's our common practice to see if there are any other minor clarifications or corrections that we would like to make since we're tackling that section. 
Um, we did identify a few small uh, corrections, really more like clarifications, just to try to make the language a little bit more streamlined and easier for the average person in the community to understand. Um, it doesn't change how we apply the standards or interpret the standards, other than just to try to make it a little bit easier for folks to, to understand. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, or you may choose to open the public hearing. Any questions? I have, I have a quick question. On the residential language, um, a suspended string of lights when found on one of the con following conditions. So one of them is restaurants, the other says, on property supporting one or two family dwelling units when located outside of the required setbacks. Is that when the lighting is outside the required setbacks? Yes. Okay. Yes, when the so lighting, you buildings or lighting. Uh, buildings aren't allowed in the setbacks either. They have right. to be outside the setbacks. Oh, well. so you can't have lighting outside the required setbacks. Correct. Cannot. Cannot. The lighting must be inside. The, okay. the lighting must be not in the not in the house, but, right. but in inside setbacks. the setbacks. Yes. Got it. Thank you. That was, it's not totally clear. Questions? Okay, um, this is a, a public hearing on this item, so I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Again, same deal, three, three minutes. And please state your name. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and staff. My name is Bernard Arguier. I live in Asheville. And uh, I've been involved with the lighting ordinance over the years, and I have no opposition to the sports section of it, which is the sport lighting, sport fields. I know that's urgent. I'm going to ask you tonight to vote on that separately and break out the string lighting, and here's the reasons why. I'm not opposed to the higher lumen limits. I think those are good, but I think there are not enough other restrictions with it. Uh, it doesn't re give you a restriction on how many of those lights. You could have hundreds or thousands of them and nobody could raise a complaint because it's not in the regulation. Planning says it's hard to enforce. Well, it's hard to enforce speed limits too, but you still have to pr provide a speed limit and a guideline of how many lights you're allowed to use. Uh, enforcement, you might get some of them. It can be complaint driven. We don't expect the city to run around and check everyone's lights every day. Um, but you do need a guideline. The other thing is it doesn't have a curfew at night. This is a dining area lighting. So when they close up at night, they just unplug the lights. There's nothing in there that requires that right now. Or in during the time of the year when it's freezing cold and there's no outside dining, it should be off. Uh, this leaves room for an unbelievable amount of illumination in the sky, into neighbors' properties. You need to have some regulations or restrictions. Even if you can't enforce them, they need to see the guidelines. So that's where I am on that. I don't quite understand why they're adding home, single and duplex homes to this, too. Um, I know it's hard to enforce that, but don't encourage them by telling them it's allowed. Let it not be allowed, and if someone does too much of it, let a neighbor file a complaint. That's easier than giving every way, everyone untethered freedom to overlight their yard with lights. Um, so it defies the whole purpose of the outdoor lighting ordinance. So I hope you split this piece off on the lights and let us work with planning on a few other little things. Uh, and I think it could be a good amendment. I do think the idea is right. It's just not completely regulated yet. So I hope you'll honor that. Thank you for your time. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Uh, my name is Dominic Lesner. I've been a resident of Asheville since hey, 91. Maggie, can you reset the, sorry, just one moment. Just, yeah, yeah. Didn't want it to be, but you go ahead. Okay. I've been a member, uh, a resident of Asheville since 91. I'm a resident of West Asheville since 2004. I live in East West Asheville. It's kind of the area between 240 and the in French Broad. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot of development in that area over the last few years. Uh, I live very close to Beecham's Curve, which um, a number of uh, new businesses have opened up there. And the reason I love Asheville, I've been here uh, in the mountains, is because I enjoy feeling like I'm part of the outdoors. And uh, I've noticed uh, uh, in the past few years, I've noticed a, a, uh, 
a deterioration of our outdoor light, of our outdoor skies. And uh, I, uh, I'm very opposed to the amendments on the uh, outdoor lighting ordinance. Uh, as uh, was stated by Mr. Arguier, <coughs> there's no limits on the string lights. Uh, so I, I would like to uh, consider a limit on those number of lights per a certain area. I would also uh, like to uh, um, suggest that, that any kind of opposition to outdoor lights for single and double family dwellings be uh, be moved to complaint driven. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I see that uh, we're about to have a lot of light outside, <laughs> unintended. <clears throat> uh, so I just want to see some some provisions made for those amendments uh, instead of just having an open court of what people can do. Okay, anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, do I have questions, comments, or a motion? Mm -hmm. I, I, I do understand this went through P and Z already. Uh, and this was in response to um, our, our, I think probably it's fair to say, unintended uh, uh, regulation of down, uh, mostly downtown bistro lighting or restaurant bistro lighting. So I, I appreciate the work that's gone into trying to revise our ordinance to navigate uh, lighting pollution uh, and people needing to run businesses that have outdoor seating and they want outdoor lighting. Yeah. Um, before I make a motion, I would ask if staff could address some of the concerns that were made by some of the individuals that came to the podium, uh, particularly the number of lights and just some of the comments that were, were made. Um, well, the kind of lights that we're describing are typically they're, they're plug-in lights, and those kind of plug-in lights we don't, we don't usually get development permits for, we don't get applications for. So there's no, no building permits, no review. So from the review side of it, things aren't, um, <coughs> things aren't checked, and so uh, it, would, it would be f entirely falls upon the shoulders of our zoning enforcement staff to go out there and enforce a number of lights per or strings per, I don't know, square foot, per area. I'm not sure what the standard, the appropriate standard would be. Um, the string lights are typically, they're just kind of off the shelf products that you buy and the lights are already arranged. You know, I, I think you could have a lot of strings, but I don't think most people would customize a string to have lights spaced tighter together. So I don't, I don't think that's a problem. It's primarily just a difficult thing to enforce from a um, from a review or even just from a in the field enforcement standpoint we can't we don't really have the numbers or the information to check for um, overall lumen levels or uniformity or spillage or things like that so. it sounds to me like it would be very difficult you'd have different sizes of outdoor dining areas and I'm not quite sure how you would do it and I do have concerns about the proposal to enforce turning the lights off I don't know that we have that I mean we have lighting standards for development in the city but I don't know that we police anyone else in terms of turning your turning your lights off at a certain time it seems like a difficult thing to to enforce I personally would not be in favor of adding that provision to this although does the ordinance all currently say that the lights can't be on during, during the, the day, yeah. Um, so we do find that sometimes people have forgotten about them, um, and when they're on during the day, you know, our enforcement staff are out, so they can, if they see that they're on, they can stop and tell. Be like a post two a.m. Right. I mean, I guess I'm not. You know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect that our enforcement guys would be out. You know, driving around, but but there are people out driving around at two a.m. And um, again, if if enforcement is complaint driven, that 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 could be. That could be something. Now, so, this has gone through P and Z. If, I mean, are we allowed to make any changes? Oh yeah. I mean, I think there are some changes we can make. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I would defer oh, to Robin to help advise us, that. depending on what the change <laughs> is. Um, the, even even as a complaint base, if I could just make one more comment regarding 
the hour of when it gets turned off, even when it's complaint based, if we get a complaint saying, well, this restaurant's keeping it on, I mean, what that means then is I have to send somebody out at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and, you know, that's, that is a hard thing to get a staff person so, to agree no, to. No, 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 sure, sure, I, I get that. I mean, so we, let's just say the enforcement staff gets a call the next day from someone saying, you know, for the last week this restaurant has left their lights on all night long and it's right next to my house and it's a pain. You, the, the staff would have to, I guess I'm wondering if there's something short of, you know, writing a notice of violation, if somebody could contact the restaurant and say, hey, just want to remind you that you're supposed to have these off when the restaurant's closed. Is that, I mean, I, I assume reminding people is an option rather than just going straight to violation. I mean, I, yeah, we can do that. I mean, I think we can do it with the way it's written now, too. So if we get a complaint about it, I, I mean, we do often sort of uh, kind of liaison between property owners and, and neighbors who are experiencing some sort of nuisance issue. Right. I, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, that seems like an easy, a relatively easy change that could be made. Maybe even, I don't, I don't have the ordinance in front of me, but even in the same paragraph around that says they can't be on during the day, just that they have to be they have to be turned off at the close of business and stay off until the business opens the next day or, or till. I mean, that seems an easy change to me. <laughs> it is an easy change as far as the ordinance goes. And is that something we can do tonight without sending it back to planning and zoning? I, I would defer to Robin. I think it would just be simply adding some language saying that lights need to, rather than being um, not on during the day, that they, we would clarify that to say be not on when the business is not open. It, it, it should be fine. I mean, the question is whether, you know, you would have gotten some comment on it had that, had that been in the amendment, but I can't imagine that being a situation that would right. call people to be upset they couldn't have be heard. They couldn't have the lights on when nobody's there. Right, or all night or whatever. Right. Okay, if everyone's excited about this idea, then I won't stand in your way. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to make a motion? <coughs> yes. Um, I move to approve the revised wording amendments to the UDO Articles 2 and 11 to expand and clarify standards for outdoor lighting and find that the request is reasonable, is in the public interest, and is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted plans in the following ways. The Amendment 1 maintains development standards to promote harmony and compatibility with surrounding properties. 2 provides flex flexibility for enjoyment and use of property at night and three, improve safety by allowing higher levels of illumination for high activity areas and uses. And, and are you open to adding the language around? Do I need to include that in my motion? And, and yeah, including the... That the lights will be closed, that lights will be, the, the patio lights will be turned off when the restaurant closes. The patio so, lights will be turned off when the business is closed. When the business is closed. And to include the amended language presented by Councilwoman Mayfield. <laughs> that the lights will be turned off when Whatever the business is closed. <laughs> um, would the council be open to adjusting that just slightly to say when the um, outdoor dining area is not in use? Sure. Because then that would cover the cold yeah, weather. Yeah. That's great. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thanks. Um, that concludes our public hearings agenda, but now we have some new business items. The first is a resolution adopting the transit master plan. Right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ely Mathis. I'm the city's transit planning manager. You're about to give Peggy's presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here. Uh, Joined by uh, Justin Willits from Tyndale Oliver and LaShawn Abraham, who's our Director of Operations at ART. Um, we're good. There we go. And um, we're 
Very excited to be with you all tonight to present the uh, final version of the transit master plan. Um, I was going to give you a more detailed update about the, some of the key points of the plan, but I think you know, Peggy already beat me to that earlier, so we'll, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. But uh, the plan's gone through numerous uh, rounds of public comment and changes. And um, at this point, uh, we've got a very strong plan. Um, it's been endorsed by a number of advisory boards and stakeholder groups, um, you know, including the Trans Committee, Multimodal Transportation Commission, Housing Authority, the Drivers Union, you know, that's just to name a few. Um, you know, I think the plan is very ambitious and it recommends major service expansions in the first year, as well as uh, continuing service expansions in every year following. Um, so it's a great plan. I think we're in a really good spot with it at this point. Uh, Justin from Tyndale Oliver is going to give you a more in-depth uh, review of the plan, and I'll turn it over to him. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, I'm Justin Willits with Tyndale Oliver. Uh, a few familiar faces to those I haven't met. Hello. Um, so I'm going to give you a relatively uh, brief overview. Um, if I'm going a little too fast, if you have any questions or concerns, slow me down. Let me know and I can clarify. Ely's going to step in towards the end and uh, answer any questions that may be more city uh, specific. So with that, I'll get started. Uh, so just to take you through uh, the timeline, uh, we started in October, uh, a lot of data collection and heavy analysis and involved the community throughout the process, uh, a lot of updates and uh, has got us to, to this point in the plan. Uh, this, this is the long list of all of the outreach we've done. Um, <coughs> some of the highlights from that are uh, these takeaways, you know, what we learned throughout the project. Uh, service, existing service levels and funding were not adequate to address the needs of the community. Um, a lot of the issues we needed to address were on-time performance related, uh, which necessitated kind of an increase in the quantity of service to address the quality of the existing service. Uh, in order to kind of enhance the mobility options for the area and address some of the community concerns we heard at the early part of the pro uh, project uh, when we had proposed to kind of scale back some of the service area. Uh, we really wanted to keep the existing coverage and focus on improving uh, access and some of the frequency without sacrificing any of the coverage area. Uh, one of the other things uh, we heard throughout the project was that uh, some of the transferring downtown was seen as an impediment to the service and the quality of service. So many of the changes you'll see in the plan are focused on moving the moving transit through downtown a little more quickly. Um, so just keep that in mind as I describe some of the service changes. Um, the summary of the sources of input uh, were primarily through the steering committees and, and a couple of community workshops, uh, two formal public meetings, uh, and a bunch of uh, discussion groups with smaller stakeholders and community groups. Um, we gave regular updates to boards and commissions, as he said, with the TC, MMTC, and the neighborhood advisory committees. And of course, the rider surveys, online surveys, and paper surveys were used throughout, throughout the project. Um, so the big Big picture changes uh, for the implementation year of 2020, which is fiscal year 19 or July of next year, uh, was the introduction of the crosstown routes, a couple of them in year one to create that faster travel time through downtown, um, removing the need to transfer and kind of making those, those trips a little quicker, hopefully attract some more riders to the system and make it a little uh, more efficient for people already using it. Uh, another big improvement um, was with the W1 and the W2. Those routes have kind of critical on-time performance issues, and the way we're uh, addressing that is we're adding another route to serve PVA uh, on its own every 30 minutes, so we're not reducing service by taking the W1 and W2 out of PVA. Uh, this is also uh, a benefit to the riders uh, west of State Street. They'll have a quicker ride into and out of uh, the downtown area, and it's also a benefit for Haywood Road with 15-minute frequency from State Street into the downtown. Uh, some other changes that you'll, you'll see in the implementation here uh, have to do with the S2 
the 170 and E2, but the S2 is now interlined with the W5, so will similarly act as a crosstown route, uh, still passing through the, the transit center, but provide another uh, one seat ride through the downtown area and then start a one way loop serving Social Security Administration and then coming back through Kenilworth uh, on the inbound trip. The 170 and E2 uh, were analyzed kind of together because they serve a similar, they serve Tunnel Road, but the E2 was serving Hall Creek on the inbound trip only, so you would have to ride out the E2 to catch it, to get to Hall Creek uh, back on the inbound. The E2 also had some on-time performance issues, so in order to address those, we've pulled the E2 out of Hall Creek and are now serving it with the 170. Uh, that service is every two hours, so not as frequent as the E2, but it does serve it in both directions, so it's not only accessible in one direction. Um, and that the service on the 170 is also being expanded with nine trips a day, the first being at 5.30 a.m. and the last being at 9.30 p.m. And one of the uh, other improvements was interlining the S4, N1, and N2. In order to increase the frequency on the S4 to 30 minutes, we needed to steal a little time for, from some other routes, so we've interlined them with the N1 and N2 so that you also get that cross-town uh, service pattern without a lot of delay at the downtown station. So if you get on the N1 or N2 and ride south on Merriman, you can stay on the bus and get down to the River Arts District and AB Tech, um, and there was a slight alignment change on the S4 uh, as well. Um, I'm drawing a blank on Bartlett, on uh, Bartlett Street, so to serve Bartlett Arms, which previously had service. Uh, one of the things we have done is preserve the service on Beaver Dam Road. Um, at, earlier in the project, we had looked at maybe eliminating that service, but based on some feedback, we've uh, we've kept it in the plan and actually increased the service hours uh, on Beaver Dam. So hopefully that will encourage a little more ridership out there. And probably the most significant change for the first year of the implementation was extending uh, weekday and Saturdays to 10 p.m. or later on almost all of the routes, um, which makes up a big bulk of the increase in service hours, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. Um, as we were tasked uh, in this plan with looking at extending services out into other parts uh, of the county, and through that uh, analysis, we've recommended a few uh, service expansions, uh, primarily with on the existing W4, which is now the Crosstown 4, um, out New Leicester Highway to serve the Ingalls and some other some other good uses out there. We've estimated the required annual service hours uh, to be considered for financing uh, partnerships with the county or private interests, whatever the case may be. Um, one other place we've recommended uh, an extension of service is Weaverville uh, via Broadway, um, which is another place where. Uh, we're recommending some partnerships are explored for financing the, uh, the service into those areas. Uh, some places where service extensions did not make sense for fixed route vehicles uh, were Reynolds, so we've proposed some alternative uh, ways of serving those areas with flex services and uh, doing some different things, but the, just purely based on the population and employment out there and some of the technical difficulties with serving it with a bus just didn't really make sense for uh, this plan. Uh, so back to uh, some of the crosstown routes, uh, we recommended them eventually coming out of the, the downtown station to pass through town even, even more quickly, uh, but we, we did recommend that there be a few stops added at Pack Square. This will help uh, really the operators uh, primarily to take quick layovers there because they won't be in the downtown station but can also really help improve access for the east side of downtown. Uh, we're not recommending any heavy uh, infrastructure there like the downtown station. This is really to help support the north-south crosstown uh, as there are other east-west stops but this would really help keep the north-south crosstown on Market Street to pass through the downtown area while increasing that travel time north-south um, from Hendersonville Road through downtown of Merriman. So 
the implementation year of July 2019, um, as I said, the bulk of, besides the technical changes to the alignments and, and those things that I've just discussed, about, I think, uh, two-thirds of the increase in service hours are dedicated to extending service on weekdays and Saturdays. We're proposing that those schedules be matched to kind of support uh, just a really consistent schedule six days a week and then kind of scaling back service a little bit on Sunday and not to run as late and try to find a little bit of savings there. Um, and that's really the big jump you'll see from the service hours in the existing year, uh, uh, this year of 81,000 to 118,000 in the first year of the plan. Um, the increase in peak fleet or total vehicles on the road will be two. Um, and then as we've discussed already, uh, there will be more direct routes, uh, reduced transfers, reduced travel times, and preserve the coverage that exists in the network today. And eventually grow that service to 32 peak buses with about 200,000 service hours in 2026. Um, so how do we... I guess Maggie thinks. <laughs> okay, so I'll breeze through these and we'll get right to the finance plan. Um, but so right here you can see the phased uh, implementation plan uh, 2021, introducing the north south crosstown, which I described a few slides ago, uh, increasing the frequency on the S3, S6. That's a really important one, I think, to get the frequency down to 60 minutes on each of those routes with just the addition of another vehicle. 2022, the extension to Inca Candler, Weaverville, and increasing the frequency on the E1. In 2023, uh, introducing the McDowell to Sweeten Creek route and increasing the frequency on the Crosstown to 30 minutes. Something to keep in mind is that annually you'll want to update this plan, like a minor in-house update for the city to make sure that it's you're still responding to the needs of the community. Any congestion or development related changes that are taking place, you can kind of shuffle these around to really kind of hit the places that you feel are best, uh, uh, most needed, excuse me. Um, and this is what those services look like phased in through 2026. Uh, and I'm gonna just breeze through since I've already been beeped at. Um, we were also tasked with looking at the fare policy uh, and what we've, what we've done is, you know, we've identified that you, you have a very low fare compared to your peers. Um, it's great for access to the system and uh, equity for people using the, the service. Um, we've, we've identified what the fare should be if it were to be raised to be on the same level as other communities of your size and characteristics. Um, we've also looked at what the fare-free impacts would be and recommended a weekend pilot uh, be done as kind of a test case. The one thing we were cautious about is going straight fare free on the weekdays immediately would have the potential to overburden the system where you may be leaving people at the bus stops because you don't have the capacity to serve all the demand that's out there. And that's kind of highlighted in the uh, lower table there where there has been overcrowding uh, reported this year. Um, those would be the routes where you wanted to keep a close eye on to see what those weekend impacts are. So if you were to go fare free, you would know to look out for that weekday ridership may really be problematic to, there may be people being left at stops on those routes. So it would, you would wanna be ready to have maybe an extra vehicle to put on the road to address that capacity issue so that you're not leaving people stranded because the demand has grown so much. Um, we've also included a facility analysis, um, which is, a little more detailed in the report, but in order to handle the, the growth in service and the number of vehicles, it's something that needs to be uh, explored very soon and will start to have capacity issues at the existing facility by 2023 or 2024. Um, so that's something to keep your eye on and that is built into the long-term financial plan. And then in 2024, we're recommending an update to the master plan. Um, is typically done by a consultant, but the the annual plans leading up to that um, are just to kind of reshuffle the service as you grow over that time, but that would be when you want to set the tone for kind of the second half of the plan 
and decide where to allocate your resources. And I'll invite Ely back up here to talk about the operations budget. But as I said earlier, that the jump from 19 to 20 of 36,000 service hours, about two thirds of that are going into expanding service from nine, from anywhere from 8 p.m. till midnight on some of the core routes. And a few of those are actually additional vehicles on the road uh, are about a third of that increase. I know we're over time, so I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. But the, uh, the table that we're looking at here at the bottom is a uh, comprehensive 10-year budget that includes all total expenditures over that time, that 10-year time frame, uh, operations, capital for buses, um, facilities, as well as city transit staff. So this, you know, this is a, a massive table, and a lot of these things are actually already programmed into the capital plan. So all of these, the bus purchases for the next five years are already in the CIP. So I don't want you know you to see this number and be kind of scared away by it. The, the more important table to look at is the top left. This uh, shows the increase in our operating budget from the current year's budget. So you know implementation year, which would be next summer, in July 1, 2019, or FY20, is about 2.5 million. Um, so, you know, so that's obviously that's not an insignificant amount, but that's definitely more manageable than what you see in this other table that includes the capital related expenses. Um, and this table on the uh, top right kind of highlights the critical funding needs that we're going to have in the near term. There's the FY20 operating budget, which is going to support this major expansion in service hours in that first year. Um, the $18,000 local match for a facility study. Um, and the $10 million local match for actually building and designing that maintenance facility. Um, you know, once we do that facility study, we'll have a better idea of what the actual total costs are gonna be. Right now, our preliminary estimates are in the range of $50 million. Um, you know, and that could go up, that could come down once we do the study. Uh, we're assuming that we would have an 80% federal match to help pay for that. So we'd be looking somewhere in the ballpark of $10 million local funding to pay for that. And that's uh, really a critical thing to keep our eye on because, um, as Justin said, you know, in the years um, 2023, 2024, we're going to be over capacity at that facility. And if we're not already in the process of building the new facility, we're at least going to have to look at alternate sites for storing buses um, and equipment, or we would have to slow down our pace of expansion. So maintenance facility is definitely something we're going to have to look at and move relatively quickly on. And that's all we have. We'd be happy to take any questions that you have. I have questions about the facility. Mm -hmm. um, what's the, so the, our, our facility currently now is, is reaching its 50 year capacity um, or usefulness. Once a new facility may be constructed, what is the usefulness of, of a new facility being constructed and what is the time frame of having it? Will, it, will, will we finance all of that to be paid for at, at construction. I, I might not be making myself clear, but <laughs> the well, first part of the question is, what is the, what is the usefulness of the new facility? How long is that going to be? The the, of years. Right. The industry standard is like 50 years uh, lifespan, um, but the, as the schedule indicates here, uh, looking at financing it in 2021, 22 for a design build um, after the study is completed, which is pretty ambitious. Uh, so completion by 23, 24 may be more likely, but the sooner the better for the uh, maintenance facility expansion study to begin so that you can start addressing that, that need. And we, we, we realize that that's ambitious and that's a limited time frame, but we didn't want to push that back any further and make it look like that can be delayed. So, you know, if we decide that that's, that's not a reasonable deadline, then we would start looking at alternatives like uh, you know, a parking area where we can set up the electric bus charging stations and things like that as <coughs> some temporary measure to hold us over. And then there was mention of a local funding match of, was it 10 million? That's our preliminary estimate. Um, is that a conservative estimate or? It's, it's, you, you don't have land identified necessarily, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of variables. Not at this time, yeah. And I mean, a lot of that. It's like very rough. Right. 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 A lot of that would depend on the outcome of the study, and that study would look at 
not just the needs of our current transit system, but I'm assuming the potential to share a site with other city facilities, um, maybe not sharing a building per se, but sharing a, a campus um, or potentially sharing facilities with the county, you know, that would all be looked at in the facility study. And based on that, there may be some cost savings there. Is it, is, is potential growth of our system itself included in that? For future yes. growth? This eight to 10 acre estimate should cover all of our future needs over that period. Yeah. And Ely, I've got a question actually. This is really more for Kathy. Um, th so we did not budget to do the feasibility study in the budget that we just adopted, correct? Well, um, it's not in the budget, but we are looking at federal grant opportunities for that. Right. And assuming that we do get those grant opportunities, we think we can find the $18,000 local match within our existing budget. Right. So we've applied for it within our uh, the build grant application that recently went out. And I think we have a, a fairly good chance of getting that. And when do we hear about that? Um, I'll have to check on that and find okay. out what the, the timeline is. I just, I just want to flag um, in, in a discussion last week, we, um, we, there, was, uh, there was a sense that we weren't going to do a study associated with the fire department, which was going to free up about $55,000. So um, Kathy, I mean, you guys obviously need to figure out if this study or something else is the right place to put that money, but if if it is helpful in getting this started, I would be in favor of of moving that over. Yeah, I feel confident that we would be able to find the eighteen thousand dollar match. Whether it's the savings from the fire study, right. uh, it would come back to city council in the form. It would go to finance committee and then come back to city council yeah. for a budget amendment. I, I guess I'm you know if it's going to be five months before we're going to hear on this grant, I don't I don't know if. Finding the money somewhere else would, it, at least to get us started, would be helpful. Well, does well, it knock us out of contention if we go ahead and fully fund it? Um, I can check on the timeline for the grant and let okay. Kathy know about that, and then that'll give you more information to make okay. a decision on. I mean, if it doesn't, great. Right. Um, can you say um, how the state budget that was just passed this year affected transit for the city, transit funding? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the state budget was passed. Um, you know, we found out this a couple days after our budget was passed, and there was about um, a $250,000 loss to our funding from what it was last year, what we were expecting for this year from our state SMAP funding. Um, SMAP. And you know, I don't. I, uh, yeah, I don't I, even yeah. know what the it's acronym. the acronym that's fun. Just in the <laughs> yeah, it's computer. So um, but it's okay. state it's funding that we time. use for operating, mm -hmm. um, and we've uh, we're making adjustments to our existing budget to try to accommodate that, um, and um, we're hoping that revenues will come in a little bit higher than projected, and that might help fill the gap right. too. Right. And that's something we're going to keep an eye on as we get further into the budget year and see if we need to make further adjustments. So that's, that is a trend that I'm hearing we're going to continue to see, that the legislature is going to fill some of their gaps with SMAP funding for cities to use towards transit. Um, you know, and the way it's couched is, well, do you want us to take it from bridge maintenance? You know, <laughs> but, uh, but unfortunately, that, that uh, I understand the overall statewide cut was about $30 million this year, and of course nobody had a chance to talk about it because the budget came came through without any committee hearings. Uh, just uh, two quick questions. Uh, just in, 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 two quick questions. In Kathy, in, in terms of the, uh, to, to Councilman Young's question about the, um, the maintenance facility, do we, have any, do we have any funding sort of set aside in our capital program for any of this? So, so there's, there's nothing there. Um, we have it, we don't have the funding set aside, but right. we have the capital program, we have identified the projects. Does that make sense, right? So, so, so do we, I realize, that, you know, we, we don't necessarily have this in there because we haven't approved it in there, but is, is, is there, I guess the question I'm asking is, is there any sort of kind of, uh, you know, marker in there or, or some amount in there that, 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 could, that could go to this currently in the capital budget? Um, if you all remember, we had identified some money that we had put into a kind of a capital reserve that mm -hmm. was around five million that we decided not to program. Okay. We so used fine. some of that um, to be able to buy the turnout, the second turnout gear for the fire department this year, the seven hundred fifty thousand. So I think there is some monies. I don't know if it would be enough to make that match, 
we would do that evaluation, but we've held that money carefully to make sure we're spending it on the right things. Got it, got it. Uh, just the other point, I just, this is more of a comment. Um, you know, I wanted to thank you all for just the comprehensiveness of this. I mean, in terms of reading through it, um, I mean, it's fantastic in terms of the service level. The other thing that, that, that I really appreciate is, you know, you, you all do have, you know, some estimate of financing. Uh, and, and that's really helpful to me, and, and I hope, you know, when we get other plans here that, that come to us, as hard as it is to estimate financing, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do, I know, um, it's just, it's very, very helpful for, for those of us on council to, to kind of think about, you know, because, you know, if we, we you know, I assume we're going to pass this tonight, once we do that, there's going to be the expectation of actually implementing it, right? Uh, and a lot of that's going to have to do with where the funding comes from. So I just wanted to commend you all in terms of, of the outreach you've done, you know, the final product you have, and just the thoroughness with which you all, uh, you know, did this plan. So thank you. Thank you. I'll only add one more thing. Um, Considering that, you know, we're going to be dump, jumping into our budget process a little bit sooner this year, this is something that we would need to flag and, and stay ahead of, considering that some of these plans are three and four years out. How we start planning in this current fiscal cycle is going to roll all the way till we want some of these uh, things to happen, uh, especially as it considers the, uh, the facility there. Um, I did have one other question also um, before you go. The fare free transit, it looks like it's, it's being asked to be implemented in July of 2019 for just the weekends. Once that, that's gonna, once that goes into effect or whatever, that's gonna be for a full fiscal year, I'm assuming, and then come back with recommendations. How is that gonna be, how is that analysis gonna be done on whether or not what recommendations are made? <clears throat> well, um, as Justin said, the primary concerns that staff have about um, going fare free are really more related to capacity issues, um, which is why we wanted to do the trial on the weekends. We have lower ridership on the weekends. There's um, less concern about buses being full and people getting left at the stops. That, that's really our concern. We don't want to make a major change to fare policy and then have that kind of blow up all these other things that we're doing. And you know, maybe that is being overly cautious, but you know, I, that's certainly what, what I would recommend. Um, you know, we would look at that and come back to council and based on probably within that first six month period of doing it, we could start developing some recommendations and say, yes, we were overly cautious. We're not seeing these massive spikes that are going to interrupt service. Um, but that, that would be the primary concern that we're looking at. And, um, you know, as far as the funding side of it, that would really be, um, a operational consideration that council would have to make. You know, that's not something that staff would recommend on one way or another. I will, I will add to that, though, that currently our fare revenues are uh, a little bit over $800,000. And as, as we make this big service expansion, I'm expecting that they would easily go up to over a million dollars. So that is kind of the amount of money that we're talking about. There are some cost savings by removing fares. We wouldn't have to add new fare boxes in the future. Um, you know, you don't have to have the staff counting money. You know, there's some basic cost saving measures there, too. But, you know, it is... Um, not an insignificant amount of money that we would be talking about. I would be interested in, um, you know, once this goes in effect, maybe getting some quarterly reports just on data mm -hmm. and what the numbers are, the ridership for the weekends. Once they start doing once it. Once they start doing it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, we can provide that. I don't think that'll be a problem. Uh, I, I appreciate the work that's been done by the consultant, especially mm -hmm. by staff. Uh, around this issue. I would also ask, uh, and staff is going to be kind of trying to line this up, uh, we believe there is a strong connection between uh, health, people's health and their access to transportation. So we are going to be moving ahead with an eye toward looking for funding locally, potentially through the new um, Mission Foundation as the ability to be able to have this transit system grow. Ely mentioned this is a very aggressive system. It helps identify some of our folks who probably are in the biggest need uh, for that, uh, those services. So we are keeping an eye on the opportunities to be able to access potentially some of that funding for this purpose. All right, thank you very much. Okay, um, so we're not in the public hearings part, so I need a motion before we take public comment. So do I have a motion to adopt? Sure, I'll make a motion that we adopt the transit master plan. 
Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Um, if you would like to speak on the motion to adopt the transit master plan, please yes. state your name and you have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Sabrina Raven, Raven and I'm pleased to have served on the transit committee, the transit master plan steering committee and the Better Buses Together core team, uh -huh. which means I've been neck deep in the TMP process all year. And I'm glad that you seem to understand, but I need to make sure that you understand how critical it is that this TMP is not just adopted tonight, but that you commit to funding it over the next few years. There's been a lot of praise for our transit expansions in the recent years, but the truth is most of those increases weren't about giving us a great system or even really a good system. They were about repairing the damage done by the 2012 makeover, which cut service to so many people. It's really only in the past year that we can say that recovery work is mostly complete. But in the meantime, our buses and garage have kept aging, our city has kept growing, our traffic has kept increases, increasing, more people have had to move out further from their jobs, and more people have less money to spend on transportation because housing costs are taking up everything they have to spare. So now we have a whole new set of problems to solve. And we must solve them. People need to know they can get to work on time. They need to be able to get to the doctor without worrying about missing an appointment because the bus didn't show up. And I need to know I can come here without worrying how I'm going to get home at night because the buses stop running before public comment even starts. I want you to be clear on this. The year one recommendations in the TMP are also not about giving us a great system or really even a good system. They're about giving us the bare essentials of a system that actually functions well enough for people to use it. Because right now our system is not functional. Our buses are still late as often as not. They still stop running too early. They still don't go everywhere they need to be. The year one recommendations aren't a magic wand, but they will go a long way towards helping solve these problems. The plan isn't perfect. Half hour service on Hendersonville Road, service to Inca Candler, those are things we should have had years ago, not years from now. I'd like to see the timeline on those sped up, as well as on the bus garage and fare free analysis. I'm sorry about the cuts to service to Kenilworth, but I'm convinced that's the best option we have right now, and we can work on returning that service in later years when we have more resources. And there's other nitpicks that I'll argue with transit staff over as we move forward. But the plan recommendations as a whole are really solid. And unlike so many other documents that come before council, this one truly prioritizes the needs of the people most affected. It's not going to give us a great system right away, but it will give us the system we need and open the door to grow a better system later on. The 2036 vision calls for public transportation that is widespread, frequent, and reliable. It says it should be easy to live in Asheville without a car and still have success. If that vision is to be meaningful, we can't wait years to start implementing it because it's going to take years of improvements to get there. But more importantly, our people need better buses now, today, not in 2036. We need you to adopt this plan and we need you to get it funded. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, folks, please don't queue up in the aisle. Just raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, thank you. But you're, you can just, you know, you made the effort. <laughs> so. right. Good evening. I'm representing Youth Empowered Solutions in partnership with Just Economics. My name is Francisco Diaz and I thoroughly support the Transit Master Plan as a youth of color. I've seen that most youth don't have access to cars, transportation, and suffer from opportunities from after school activities such as band and sports. I feel that this won't only affect youth, but it will affect everybody in our community. I feel that people will have better health because they would have more access to health care, more access to food, and public parks exercise. Routes running later would also help people get to jobs more and stay later in those jobs and work more. <clears throat> I think fare free would get more support not only in the weekends, but also help during the weekday since people would, would think that, oh, this, the bus system is actually working now. It's not just like it was before. And I think more effective routes, especially on Patton Avenue, I myself have seen people waiting in line in the rain, waiting for a bus to come. And I think that thanks to the new transit master plan, that this <clears throat> could be effect, could be helped. And I think expanding to areas more like Woodfin and Weaverville and even, even AC Reynolds, which there's no bus routes currently, I think that will help people. 
I support the transit, ma the transit master plan, and I hope you do as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Okay. Well, it's hard to tell. <laughs> You'll be next. Yeah. You're here. Hi, Mayor and the st City Council. I am Cindy Oak, along with Leslie Anderson and Tina Stovall, representing Family to Family in the Reynolds District of Buncombe County Schools. And as you know, since 2013, Family to Family has been addressing the need for public transportation from the city limits at River Ridge Shopping Complex out to the Reynolds Middle and High Schools, a distance of 1.9 miles. And this is a need firmly outlined by school officials. And after gathering data, conferencing with students, families, we've confirmed that the majority of the Reynolds Middle High School students or families live within the city limits, pay city county taxes, and yet do not have access to public transportation to their schools in order to participate in school activities, both academic, social, and otherwise. So while located in the county, Reynolds Middle and High Schools are definitely urban schools. Specifically, national research shows that the graduation rates of marginalized students who do not have transportation to their schools are significantly affected. And we have learned this with conversations with students to confirm this. Opportunities to make up absences, take advantage of remediation for credit courses on the AB Tech campus while in high school are only a few denied to these students due to the lack of public transportation from the Reynolds campus into the city again only 1.9 miles away from a city transit stop our negative our data has also showed the negative impact on business development residential apartment complexes along highway 74a and um, when this public transportation is not available now after nearly 35 meetings and presentations with city council members city transit planners the transit committee and county commissioners and transit planners over the last three years we are optimistic to now have the attention of both our city and county officials addressing the need to provide expanded public transportation not only for our Reynolds community but in other critical areas of the county as reflected in this 10-year master plan the city transit planners and the consultants who were paid by the city and county funds have creatively and clearly determined a solution that will meet the need we have stated in our Reynolds community. We thereby support the proposed Asheville City 10-year transit master plan that outlines a deviated fixed route or flex service along Highway 74 a quarter from the River Ridge Shopping Walmart shopping complex to the Reynolds campus as described on pages 68 through 71. We also want to publicly acknowledge Elias Mathis. Sorry. Thank you. I just want to say acknowledge his work, which was amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello. I am James Yamura, and I am representing Just Economics and also um, beloved Astro, and I'm a walking billboard too. <laughs> uh, so, um, I got my little guideline here, but I pretty much don't need it, but I'm going to just glance at it anyway. So, um, as I said, I'm James Gumbrell, and uh, I'm representing Just Economics and the um, Better Buses Together campaign. And so, um, I've known several people that, because the buses have not gone, you know, towards like business hours of working, like say, fast food or something like that, they usually get off around 11 or so, and several people living far, far away from their job have to stay in the back area in the bushes in order to sleep and spend the night because the next bus shows up, you know, around 6 or so in the morning the next day. That's, I've seen that happen several times, and it's really, really bad. So, um, you know, um, so um, we're, you know, seeing about trying to ask all, as these other people have said, uh, to please vote yes on towards this uh, master plan because, you know, everybody um, worked, you know, pretty hard on it. You know, as you all know, you read the paper set and just display before you and, and here and all. And um, so, well, as well as, oh yeah, yeah, tons of people 
that um, just economics and other organizations as well has gone out and done surveys and stuff like that, and you know, and, and gave them um, you know to the proper people to you know tell you um, what what all is good and what all is bad about buses and all. And then Sabro said, "Oh my God, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the situation there. The buses are just like like dying on the street." And I know that they're old. They were getting five more, you know, like like towards the winter time or so. But um, you know, geez, ways it, it's you know it needs a really really good uh, overall, and uh, so that's basically uh, all I got to say. So uh, thank you, thank you everybody. All right, <laughs> who says a round of applause? Hi, I'm Vicki Meath with Just Economics and also a, a West Asheville resident. Um, on behalf of Just Economics, I want to encourage you to support the plan. And I also want to publicly thank Ely and the consultants. Uh, to be honest, we, we had a lot of issues with the original draft of, you know, the first draft that was publicly presented. But after lots of um, discussion and work on their part to work with us, to work with riders, other advocates, and other community members, we're in a position to say that we think that this is a good plan and this represents a broad vision for, um, for transit in Asheville. We think uh, that this, it, it's important to, to, to pass this plan tonight. It's also important for you all to really prioritize the funding for this plan. As James was um, mentioning, over the past month in particular, we've seen a lot, a lot of service interruptions, um, a lot of, uh, if, if you ride the bus or if you uh, subscribe to iRide, you'll see that lots of the buses have been breaking down. Um, the last month is, has been pretty extreme. And that's because we didn't spend the capital that we needed two years ago to have the, the bus replacements. This plan, as well as the work that Ely has been doing over the past several years, um, has a good bus replacement plan, has this facility um, uh, in, in the plan, um, and we need you to look at both the operations and the capital expenses, and really to think about how we're gonna fund that. We know that there's the probable sale of Mission Hospital that will not only set up the Mission Foundation, but will br bring in, likely bring in uh, tax dollars into the, the city budget, and we're hoping that you'll kind of take a look at how we can use some of that to, uh, to increase transit. Thanks. Good evening, Council. I'm Reverend Amy Cantrell. It's an honor to speak tonight. Access, access, access. That's what this plan does. Opportunity, yes, health and health care. This is an employment issue, a housing issue, and I could go on and on. Public transit is something that we all need and we can all benefit from. I want to say what an honor it has been to serve on the Transit Master Plan Steering Committee along with countless other community members who have volunteered countless hours um, to bring this plan before you tonight. And I want to say what it, what it is to me to see the community really invited into a process. And I just want to hold this up as a model. And I want to thank uh, Tyndale Oliver and Ely and LaShawn and all the others that have been really working to make this a community plan. And I think it's a model for civic engagement. Um, necessity riders, the most impacted people um, affected by this plan were centered, were listened to, were honored and heard throughout as the experts that they are. And so I want to say that we need to vote yes for this plan. This, this is a solid plan. Um, these folks that, that are on the consultant team met, they would take meetings uh, hours before we were moving something forward because we wanted to get it right. Um, and so we bring this to you tonight. This is the bare minimum for creating a powerful transit system that actually works for the whole community. Our system's been tired and broken and dysfunctional for a long while. 
and thanks to dedicated rider advocates, dedicated council members, dedicated city transit staff, we have worked to fix many of these struggles together. We have a serious opportunity to adopt a public transit plan that will bring a more robust and workable transit system that allows Asheville City community members to get to work, to school, to health care, to grocery stores, yes, Sabra, to and from city council meetings, um, and to many, many other things that we can take advantage of as people living in Asheville. I want to urge you on several things. I want to urge you to look at this fare-free trial and move to a fare-free system as an equity issue in a way that, that we can support sustainability goals as well. To urge you to find the $18,000 to begin to move this uh, maintenance facility study forward so that we can get that done more quickly so we're not slowed down by the fact that we don't have the infrastructure that we need. Again, this is a plan that we will continue to work on and improve and improve and improve in the ways that all we do coming together as volunteer advocates and council members and staff. But I urge you to vote yes tonight and to commit to funding, fully funding this plan as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Does anyone have any other comments before we vote on it? Yes. I just want to say a quick thing. Um, I, I was going to say a little bit more, but I can't say any more eloquently than the speakers tonight um, what this system, what this plan is going to do for our transit system and what it's going to do for people who live here. This is about making life better for people who live here um, and helping us achieve our, our city vision, which I was going to read, but Sabre beat me to it. So this is about building a transit system that allows you to live here without a car, which makes Asheville eminently more affordable for more people. Um, I also want to just call out Ely and, um, and the consultant team and all of the people who served on the steering committee. This has been just a tremendous amount of work. Thank you very much. And it just makes my heart sing that we have the advocates supporting the, this plan in the way that you are. So thank you. I would echo that. That, that was um, nice to hear that this uh, community input process worked. And I want to thank all of you being the members of the community that spent your time working with the staff to get this in a place that was positive and good and something you could support because I know it takes a lot of time to attend all those meetings and provide all that feedback feedback and review all of the drafts so thank you for doing that and for coming here tonight to speak on it and we do need to dedicate ourselves to funding it and now we just got to find the money <laughs> that's our job <laughs> all right um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. <laughs> okay, we have another. Uh, council, we do we do have a closed um, session tonight. Uh, but I think we'll do the we'll we'll see how it goes and keep on going. Um, the next item is a resolution to recommit one million dollars to a local community land trust, recognize the formation of the Asheville Buncombe Community Land Trust, and provide a letter of support for the land trust, showcasing our continued staff support and the efforts of the land trust in achieving its 501c3 tax exempt status. Hi. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Uh, Paul D'Angelo with um, the Community and Economic Development Department, the Housing Development Specialist. We're very excited to be here tonight to talk about the Community Land Trust and consider this resolution. Um, as you know, the City of Asheville has $1 million of affordable housing bond funds allocated to a Community Land Trust. A Community Land Trust is a great, uh, permanently affordable um, housing uh, home ownership tool that we can use here in Asheville uh, with the development of the um, ABCLT, the Asheville Bumpkin Community Land Trust. Um, over the past 14 months, city staff and particularly members of the community have worked very hard to help develop uh, this community land trust. Uh, steering committee um, worked very hard almost every week since January on Monday nights. 
um, and determined that it was best to create a single community land trust that could target specific neighborhoods, uh, particularly predominantly African-American neighborhoods that are facing gentrification-driven displacement. This new, um, as I said, uh, community land trust will be the Asheville Bumpkin Community Land Trust, ABCLT, and they're committed to build as much local uh, ownership and accountability as possible in these neighborhoods in which the CLT will operate. On Monday, June 11th, um, 2018, a formal board was appointed uh, to oversee the ABCLT. Articles of incorporation have been filed for this new entity. Also on the 9th, uh, reviewed, uh, bylaws were reviewed and they actually have been passed um, in the previous meeting and several members of the Community Land Trust just last weekend uh, attended a conference in Durham to speak with the folks at the Durham Community Land Trust where there was a lot to learn and talk about our next phase in developing this uh, Community Land Trust and its capacity. Uh, these bond funds directly support Council's 2013 uh, 2036 vision of a diverse community, a thriving local economy, and quality affordable housing. The pros, community land trusts, are a recognizable best practice for pre preserving and creating long-term affordable home ownership opportunities. A con budget constraints limit the availability and use of funds. The Asheville Buncombe County CLT will also need to find additional sources of revenue for operations and administration. Fiscal impact, affordable housing bonds are in the existing budget. Existing resources can also be used for additional technical assistance. Our recommendation, uh, the Housing uh, Community uh, HCD Committee recommended at their June meeting that City Council recommit their support of the $1 million in affordable housing bonds for a local CLT, recognize the formation of the ABCLT, and provide a letter of support to the ABCLT in their efforts to achieve 501 C3 tax exempt status. status. And I can answer any questions. Has so um, they haven't yet been able to apply for the 501c3 status. Uh, their uh, the letter of support will help them with okay. um, with but, completing so that process. And about what's the turnaround right now um, to get 501c3 status? Um, that would be a great question. Justin Edge from Pisgah Legal is here. He might have a better answer on how quickly that would take. Yes. Should I? You can just okay. yell. All right, great. Uh, well, only if it's short. Like, it's, yeah. Maybe you better come for it because Maggie's going to. She's she's going to come pounce on you. Yeah, but it's just like nine months. Yeah, but apparently it's kind of like if you get ready to do a lawyer. Oh. Well, you just told me it depends because that that <laughs> that is the answer that I'm going to give. I told you you were going to give the long uh, lawyer yeah. answer. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, counsel. Um, the turnaround on a 1023 with the IRS, which is the application for tax exempt status, um, has been getting shorter and shorter over the years, but it is still quite a long process. Um, in the full form of the 1023, which is with an organization of this budget, mm -hmm. we'll need to go through the full 1023, which we're currently working on. Um, I would I would be very hesitant to give you any guarantees. I think the IRS tells you two years or less. They're seeing six turnarounds. I mean, it's very common to see a full 1023 turnaround in under six months these days. Um, however, because of this, we have, as we've begin, begun pursuing uh, different foundation funding and things like that, we've been working out uh, one-off uh, fiscal agent arrangements yes along the way so um, we're not letting it hold us back we're moving forward with it but it qualifies under a number of different uh, types of tax exempt status um, so basically what uh, we're asking council to do tonight is uh, with your letter of support it ends up backing up one form of tax exempt status which is lessening the burdens of government it's the city recognizing that we consider affordable housing a burden of this local government and we are going to partner with this organization in order to lessen that burden directly on the government so that's what we're looking forward to thank you hopefully hopefully three four months five months <laughs> that's what we're hoping for. Thank you. any other questions okay so do i have a motion to support uh, the resolution recommitting $1 million of bond funds to a local community land trust, recognizing the formation of the Asheville-Buncombe County Land Trust and providing a letter of support to showcase 
continued staff support and the efforts of the land trust in achieving its 501c3 tax exempt status. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Is there anyone wishing to comment on the motion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Esther, I, I'm sorry. We also need to really recognize all of the people who have been working on this. Paul said they have been meeting essentially weekly since January. Okay, that stand is, up. That is you've insane. Been working on this, right? If you've so been on we this, can see you are. Come on, okay. come on. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. You're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and that was Libby Kyle and our former mayor Terry Bellamy. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, Thank you for doing that, Julie. Our last item on our printed agenda. Okay, is everybody still hot? We've been fooling around with this. It's hot, hot. Okay. It is hot. All right, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, boards and commissions, Vice oh, Mayor. That's great, thank you. Um, so, uh, once again, we have a long list of appointments, so bear with me, uh, but again, I'm going to say it for the hundredth time. Uh, we've just really seen an amazing number of citizens who are coming, residents and citizens who are coming forward and volunteering to be part of these boards and commissions. And the number and quality, just even during my tenure, as is is really great. So um, we can't always pick you um, when you apply, but I hope you don't get discouraged. I hope you stay involved in the in the city. Uh, so for boards and adjustments, uh, we, boards and commissions recommends that we re-advertise for that alternate position. I need a second. Did you Brian seconded. Oh. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, Citizens Police Advisory Committee uh, for the North Asheville position Boards and, and I'm just going to go through all of them. Um, boards and commissions recommends Blake Marcus for the central position, Jerry Kivett, and for the housing authority representative, Jean Bell. Uh, that's the recommendation. I need a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Uh, for the Civic Center Commission, Boards and Commissions recommends Kim Hunter, Bill Jones, and Kyle Smith. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, for the Civil Service Board Chair, the Civil Service Board is in the process right now of selecting their fifth member. They have four members right now, and the the the, the four current members uh, select a fifth member. They are in the process of doing that and uh, we are going to postpone the naming of a chair until that fifth member is appointed. For, uh, Vice Mayor, that's, that's happening like the, within a week, right? Yeah, and it, um, under, the, under the law, the Civil Service Board must appoint that fifth member within 30 days. So I believe they have until like August 8th. So it, it will definitely be taken up at the next meeting. Uh, for the electrical examiners, uh, we're going to re-advertise that one. For the Homeless Initiative Advisory Committee, uh, there are two vacancies. And uh, the board, boards and commissions would recommend Donna Ball and Joel Steininger, I believe is how you pronounce the name. And uh, that's the recommendation. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. For the I-26, I-26 connect, Connector Aesthetics Committee, uh, Boards and Commissions recommends Woodard Farmer, Joe Minicosi, Michael Adams, David Nutter, Michael Zukoski, Tall Ghani, Ted Figura. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Multimodal transit, uh, the transportation, I'm sorry, commission, boards and commissions recommends Rachel Sorensen Cox. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. 
Uh, Neighborhood Advisory Committee, the Boards and Commissions recommends that we re-advertise for that position and also for the Noise Ordinance Appeals Board. For the Planning and Zoning Commission, Boards and Commissions recommends that we reappoint for uh, second term both Tony Hauser and Guillermo Rodriguez. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Lovely. Uh, for the Tourism Development Authority, this is uh, for both of these openings. It requires that under, under the law, it requires that our appointments be responsible for lodging facilities of 101 and more rooms. And so boards and commissions would recommend the reappointment of Hamachu Carveer and John Luckett. Could second. I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and for the Tree Commission, uh, we recommend that we will re-advertise that. And then this one, um, Parks and, the Parks and Rec Recreation Board, uh, we had rec recommended a member and the person has moved out of town, uh, or and not even out of town, just even out of the county. So uh, we are, board, boards and rec, Boards and commissions would recommend uh, the appointment of April Settles. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Once again, thanks for all the applications. I really, it's really great to see all the interest. Um, and thanks for all the volunteering. Okay. All right. Um, I have a few people signed up to speak. We're, we're at the public comment period of the meeting. Um, and I'm just going to take them in order uh, as they signed up. The first person to, who signed up is Steve Foster. Um, and this public comment works just like all the other public comment. Uh, please state your name. And there's, well, I just read your name, but uh, you have three minutes. Ten minute period. And have if, three people who can see their time. Okay. And please identify, if you are willing to waive your time to this speaker, please identify yourself. Just raise your hand. Okay. One, two, three. So that means you are waiving your time to speak this evening on the, on the during the public comment period. Okay. <coughs> My name is Steve Foster and I'll get through this pretty quickly. If Facebook is correct, I wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Could be fake news. <laughs> uh, thank you for allowing the Council of Independent Business Owners to make public comment regarding the City of Asheville annual budgeting process for upcoming and subsequent years. My name is Steve Foster. I'm representing the Council of Independent Business Owners Budget Committee uh, professionally, I've been a CPA here in Asheville for more than 30 years. We understand that you have completed the budget process for 18 and 19. Certainly we understand that you are happy that the process is over and you can get on with other business. Our committee, however, is concerned that the discussion of some real infrastructure items have not received as much attention as other issues. These infrastructure items include police funding, improvements to stormwater, street maintenance, and the transit authority. Although you have completed your work for this year's budget, our intent is to ensure that the budget for next year and beyond will reflect real management by the city council and set a course for long-term accountability. With regard to the police funding piece, the site citydata.com, which coincides with similar documentation you've received from our own police department, reports that the city of Asheville is 90% higher in overall crime than other United States cities. Recent events show serious homicides, property crimes, and domestic problems that are common within the city's jurisdiction. Unfortunately, police have often judged their worst, police are often judged on their worst performance versus the good that they perform day in and day out. Instead of the cuts to the city council police department, there should be additional funding for extensive training not only for new police officers, but also for seasoned officers. We request that you consider a 20% increase in funding to train, 
for training of officers and that the department increase its beat patrol by a minimum of 10 officers to ensure an adequate force is in place when turnover and retirement occurs. We strongly suggest further that elected council members spend time with the police on actual ride-along calls dealing with things like domestic situations and general police work throughout the city in order that the day-to-day -day work of the police officers may be recognized. Now stormwater. We have received many complaints about this infrastructure item. For years, all property owners and businesses inside the city limits have paid into the stormwater utility fund. In fact, the city, re the city report on the utility shows that the budget for the department's 42 employees is over six and a half million. However, the problem we had 10 or 20 years ago appeared to be even greater now. Our question is this, is this just a big slush fund or is there some serious work going on? Prior to the formation of the utility, stormwater was included in the city's public works budget. Now with the utility, it does not seem like any greater effort is being accomplished. Today, we have a utility that collects millions of dollars from property owners across the city representing several additional cents on property tax rate. The question must be asked, are we better off with the extra utility tax? What happened to the original tax dollars that were being spent on the city's, in the city's public works budget to repair and replace stormwater infrastructure? Since initially, the fund was mainly designed as an educational piece of the stormwater puzzle. The stormwater utility should be reduced to only include the educational piece and the actual funding of the stormwater repair should be back in the city's public works budget and managed out of the city's general budget process to ensure more lines are being fixed. The repair of dilapidated lines should receive a quarterly public report at city council meetings. On streets, from information in the city's own street resurfacing plan, the average city street can wait 80 years to be resurfaced, which is 55 years longer than the life of asphalt. Does that sound realistic? Is the council talking about that? The average street in, in cities throughout North Carolina have a street rating of 80 to 90 on the pavement conditioning index scale, which is in the good range, while streets in Asheville rate at 60 and are considered poor. Of course, a certain amount of the recent bond money is being spent on streets, but even that large amount of one-time influx isn't making a dent in the overall condition of city streets. Why not spend some more time on this and fix more streets in and around neighborhoods and businesses? Street maintenance should be considered a basic service that separates rural from urban areas. That's why Asheville is an urban city. Other councils have ignored this problem, but it must be addressed. We recommend council adequately fund street repair and that a quarterly accountability report be given. And finally, the transit system. We don't question the need for a bus system, but you are spending $2 million a year to fix streets that may take 80 years to receive repair, only to spend $5 million per year subsidy for the city to drive buses over some of the same streets. Do you see a problem? We do. Low repair of streets, annual increased subsidies in a bus system that continually runs on these dilapidated streets equals disaster. This is not sustainable. You must figure out a way to operate a bus system in a more even, break-even manner and at the same time repair the streets that they need to utilize. The current operation of the bus system is not sustainable. You simply cannot afford the annual subsidy plus its growth year after year. It's going to catch up to the city. Now's the time to address it. You must find a way to make the system operate on a break-even model. Otherwise, the citizens who depend on the system are going to end up with no service at all because it's gone bankrupt. You're the managers, that's what you are elected to do. <coughs> in conclusion, we urge council to take advantage of the unprecedented growth in the city of Asheville and focus resources on core infrastructure needs. With the addition of recent bond money along with regimented discipline, funding stream, council can recapture the future of the city and once again say the best days of the city are ahead. Thank you.
Thank you. The next person I have signed up to speak is uh, Libby Kyles. Um, I do see that uh, CBO is passing out information to the press, and I would offer that some of the information was incorrect in that statement, but that's on us to do a better job uh, regarding our capital ma management program and uh, just talking to folks about the use of the stormwater funds, and I'm looking at Kathy Ball, our manager, who can help provide information about that. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ms. Kyles. Go ahead. Yes. I understand you probably need 10 minutes. Yes. And you've got some folks here that will wave time to you. They'll just raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Libby Kyles. I'm a public school teacher at Isaac Dixon Elementary School. And in addition to that, I run a nonprofit called YTL Training Programs. You transform for life. Um, I want to speak to you today from three different perspectives, as a parent, as a teacher, and then as a community member. Um, as a parent, my daughter is sitting back there, Leah. Um, I am very protective of my daughter, like all parents are. I monitor what she sees, I monitor what she hears when I can, but I can't be with her always. So when she goes out in the other places, public places, she sees images, she hears people talking about people of color and children of color in a way that's not positive. When I was eight in Asheville, my experience was very different than what Leah's is now. When I was eight, I spent a lot of time on 13 Velvet Street, which is where your public work buildings are located now. Those were my grandmother's houses. We used to walk to Stevens Lee and when we walked to Stevens Lee, that's where we went to play games. We had community. I think I may have told one or two of you that that's where I became the air hockey champion. Um, because it was a building that was purpose for gathering of children of color um, in a positive way. And as a child growing up in Asheville, I often heard stories about Stevens Lee and about you know, the great band and the academic excellence and how you didn't act out in school because you knew you were gonna see your teacher and your teacher was gonna see your mom at church. And there was this great community that was built in that place. And today, our children are missing out on that. They're missing out on the history and the beauty of black Asheville from back then. And I think it's really important that as we think about what's going on in our community with our youth, that we think about reimagining what that space could be. Reimagining a place where children of color come and they feel safe and they feel at home. Because on the walls, they see people that look like them. They see doctors, they see lawyers, they see judges, they see bankers, they see the Al White size, the people who came out of that space and they see the history of excellence. That's not something that they get to see every day. That's not something that they get to hear. And that is what Stevens Lee means to me. And I think to most native of the black community in Asheville, it was a place of academic excellence. And it was a place where you had little, but you did so much with the little that you had and you had so much pride in it that it was just great. Even secondhand books were great. I would like for us to reimagine Stevens Lee as a place where children of color come in the door and look around and see themselves. That's my perspective as a parent. My perspective as a teacher, having taught Nashville City Schools for the past 14 years, I was a teacher assistant for two years. The school can only do so much. I love every kid in my classroom and I want the best for every kid in my classroom. And I do my best for every child in my classroom. But there are circumstances happening in our communities that are beyond my control, your control, anyone's control. So what do we do about that? We can't just continue to blame the teachers and say, oh, if only you did this. Something else has to happen outside of the school building. And I think, and, and let me say, not just Stevens Lee, I actually believe it's a bigger conversation. 
I actually believe that we should have these conversations about all of those buildings that were given or turned over to the city when schools were closed for integration and they were then turned into rec centers. We need to reimagine all of those spaces. We need to consider what would it look like if we put grassroots organizations in these places and supported them to do the work that they know to do. One of the most upsetting things in any community is when you have people come in and mandate to you what they think you need versus listening to the people who are on the ground doing the work on a daily basis and having something like what we have for the transit system for our community. Does that make sense? Um, and so as a teacher, I deal a lot with trauma in school and in the classroom. And one of the things that I would love to see happen as we, I hope you've had a chance to read the Stevens Lee proposal that I sent, um, is that having that place where the hours aren't work hours, the typical eight to four, nine to five type deal. But there are other things that can happen in that space that would be beneficial for children of color and that would also give them the tools that they need to deal with those trauma. I know everyone up here has heard of ACEs, right? You know, when I first took my first training, I identified six markers in myself. It was the most devastating probably 45 seconds that I've had in my life. But what I realized in that moment is if I identify six in myself and I consider my childhood to be much easier than what I see children going through now, how many markers can we identify on them? And what can we do as a community to combat what's happening in their lives? We can't fix everything, but there are some realistic steps that we can take. And one of those realistic steps, I believe, is giving Stevens Lee back to the community and allowing us to have programming in there that deals with trauma. And, and when I say trauma, trauma exists in all walks of life. It's not just the trauma that happens in the neighborhood. Children walk into schools and they don't feel safe. And that is an issue. Um, if you haven't, there's a book by Zaretta Hammond called Culturally Relevant Teaching and the Brain. And that book talks about the fact that it's not that children of color can't learn, because that's what that, you know, achievement gap would say. But it's that they don't feel safe. And so when you don't feel safe, your brain is really focusing on two things, your wellness and your safety. And your safety is first. So if I walk into this building, very few people look like me. Nothing on the wall reminds me of me. And immediately I'm expected to transform into this image of this perfect kid who sits quietly and doesn't make any noise and does exactly what he or she is asked to do. That's unrealistic. Because my brain is thinking I need to be safe and I'm not feeling safe right now. So as a teacher, I think it would be really important that we had community spaces that were able to operate based on what grassroots organizations know would be helpful for all of our children. The last perspective I want to speak from is as a community member. So I heard the comments about funding for the police department and more patrolling. If we put as much energy into working for our youth and building around our youth and creating systems that enhance our youth. A lot of that, those things that we keep hearing about in terms of needing all this funding for police to police people wouldn't be necessary. It's important. I believe that Asheville is at a pivotal point. I think this is kind of one of those places where it's a, a, a now or never make or break moment. And in your hands, you have a, a time where you could turn some things around for children of color. I want to speak to the fact that I sent this proposal directly to city council for a reason. It is not that I have not tried to work with Parks and Rec, because I have. A year and a half ago, I met with people from Parks and Rec, and I was told that they would take it to a committee. Months passed, I heard nothing. And then when I contacted them again, I was told, well, the committee decided to do something different. 
And I asked, did you take it to committee? And I was told yes. But then I spoke to two people on that committee and they had never heard of the proposal. I then spoke to Kimberly Archie and Jamie Matthews and we met and we talked. One day I got an email from Jamie saying submit another proposal. And I did that. And once again, months went by. And I emailed Jamie back and said, I don't understand what's going on. Well, I get an email a couple of days later saying, oh, I for somehow forgot you on the email list where the director, I'm sorry, sorry. director um, had emailed denying the proposal, everyone but me. So communication for me and this process in Parks and Rec just has not been the greatest. I would like to propose that you lease Stevens Lee to YTL training programs at a dollar a year for the next 15 years, um, that you would maintain the property as you always have, and that you would invest some money and time and energy into that space to be better used for children of color. So the reason I've been the male fan of here, uh, I'm fan. we have 22 African American males that have pledged to help Libby as far as the coverage in any facility that she gets, primarily Stevens Lee, that we will help her to make sure it's a safe environment for her to have whatever programs are necessary. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, Libby, thank you so much for all the work you do for our community, and thank you for working so hard on this proposal and reaching out to all of us and meeting with, I think you've been able to meet with most of us um, to talk to us about this proposal. And I know we've got some other folks here that are very interested and may want to speak about it. Um, Stevens Lee is a, is, it was uh, an African-American school in our city, and when schools were desegregated, we know um, the students there were told to leave that school and go to the uh, desegregated school. And that is the story for other facilities throughout our city, and the city ended up being the entity that held these properties, <coughs> um, not by any intentional or strategic plan. Uh, and I don't, and I, I don't speak, I don't want to speak for all the, the folks up here on council, but I, I don't have any particular um, interest in the city continuing to own and run these facilities forever. There's no reason that necessarily needs to happen. Um, it, to, to see a future and better use that better serves the community is a great, is a great idea. Um, I, you know, we've struggled with how, how does council, how can council help you? Uh, and because we know the facility is being used by some folks already, it has some programming in it already, uh, and and so some, obviously there'll be some scheduling things to work out. There's an alumni association that um, uh, meets, and and well, you know, there's a lot of different stakeholders. I assume that will want to be able to talk about this proposal and the future use for Stevens Lee. Um, and I'm looking over at the city manager because I'm, I'm hopeful that council can kind of guide some next steps here tonight, that this isn't just a presentation that you make to us and we don't know what to do and we don't know what to do next. Um, it sounds like the methods that we have in place already aren't working uh, and we need to try something different for you. I don't know, Kathy, if you've had any opportunity to think about this or what we might suggest in terms of next steps. So I would welcome um, any comments tonight from council specifically, but I think from a staff perspective, we would propose to come back to you at your August meeting with an overview of the current users of the building, the demographics of those users, uh, the staffing there, maybe condition facilities report, uh, and provide information to you at that meeting so that you would understand how the building is currently being used. 
we could also talk and be able to pull together an example of two or three different processes that you may want to consider in making this decision uh, and, and for example um, you know we could talk more about whether that process is a lease or you, you know what the what the how much it would cost to maintain it and whether the city would be responsible but we'd like to bring back to you more information so that you would be able to evaluate it based on the proposal that uh, Ms. Kyles has put forward. I would, I would be in a agreement with that. that. That sounds really good. I think um, maybe also during this process between now and coming back to council with something uh, if, if Ms. Kyles could be uh, privy to information that she needs to to better adapt to any sort of uh, uh, whatever, just privy to information as it's as it's being flowed out to council. And um, we got a note from the board, the uh, Parks and Recreation Board, the Citizen Board, that they'd like to be, you know, consulted uh, in this in this process. They're going to have a retreat um, in September, so we could possibly wrap them into the discussion too. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think, I think including the, obviously parks staff has to be part of this discussion. I think the parks board would be great as well. I'd also like to suggest that the housing and community development, or that the community development staff be included in this. Um, that's a group of people that have worked very closely with many of the groups that um, Libby, many of the grassroots groups that Libby works with and I think would be contemplating um, might also use the space. So I think having staff in the room that have familiarity with those groups and what they're about and what they're trying to do would be very helpful. I'd just like to thank Libby for um, stepping forward with a vision of this um, sort. I, be I believe that in a community um, like ours that has gone through, um, has had a reproach over our head for a very long time as a black community, I believe that people start to let off restraints when there is no vision. So thank you for setting vision in place for our community and thank you for um, coming through the back door after other um, avenues have been closed to you or not as accessible to you. So thank you for being courageous and continuing the conversation because I do believe that Asheville is ready now to make some moves, but we're gonna have to um, really push and keep this conversation at the forefront. Um, I would advise you to really um, wrap around a lot of the community groups, um, East End Community Association, also the Stevens Lee Alumni Association, and other stakeholders who, um, who hold space in that building. Get as much support as you can because when we come as a unified f um, force, then we provoke change. So um, thank you for your support. And the 22 gentlemen who are lending their support, that's gonna be very powerful moving forward. So, so thank you and continue being courageous. Anybody else? Okay, so, we, so it sounds like we'll revisit. So we'll, be, we'll, we'll um, work with staff. We'll also um, include the other, um, the items that you all have recommended. We'll include Ms. Kyles and anybody that she feels like is pertinent to the conversation and then be prepared to make a presentation back at your August 28th meeting. Does that work for you, that timeline? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna keep, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna, I've, the next person I've signed up to speak is Carmen Ramos Kennedy. Um, did you, oh, did she I think leave? she left. Okay, yeah, I had her down for transit master plan, so. <laughs> um, the next person is Mac Swicegood. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. My name is Max Weisgood, and I live in the city of Asheville, and I'm representing the following, presenting the following resolution on behalf of the council and independent business owners. <clears throat> A resolution in support of the city of Asheville Police. Whereas the men and women of the city of Asheville Police Department wear their uniforms with honor, dedication, and integrity, as they protect and defend the city they serve, 
and whereas there are approximately 163 law enforcement officers serving the city, along with 300 employees in the entire Asheville Police Department, whereas officers and personnel within the police department deserve support from the local community and adequate training in order to perform their duties. Whereas the uniforms which are worn and earned with hard work, commitment and pride by these officers have in recent times become targets simply because of their profession and their commitment to duty. And whereas we, the Council of Independent Business Owners, support the men and women of the City of Asheville Police Department who stand every day as our guardian of peace and order, ready to protect our homes and businesses, the weak and the oppressed, and our very freedom. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of Independent Business Owners that the Council of Independent Business Owners publicly acknowledges their support for the commitment and sacrifice made by each and every member of the City of Asheville Police Force resolved by the board of directors of the council and independent business owners thank you thank you very much the next up is ray spells okay apparently isn't interested anymore elizabeth shell Hi, my name is Elizabeth Shell. I am a business owner downtown. I'd just like to say I totally disagree with what was just said. Um, but I'm here as a member of Asheville Showing Up for Racial Justice, of which I have been a, um, one of the core leaders since 2016. Um, and this is a statement I would like to share for, with you from uh, the core team. Uh, we are disturbed at revelations by the Citizen Times about the surveillance conducted by the APD of our group of Asheville Black Lives Matter and other community members who took action in the summer of 2016 to hold the police department accountable for the killing of Derry Williams. However, we are not surprised. Today, as in past generations, police are being used to attack our communities and movements for change. These incidents are not isolated, and they are not happening because the city wants to create safety or address threats. They are an attempt to divide us, isolate us, and create fear and distrust among us by lab labeling our actions for justice as criminal. Since July of 2016, we have been alarmed to witness the APD under Chief Tammy Hooper resist any attempt to be held accountable for their actions. They have lied to the public, distorted the truth, falsified data, used racial profiling in traffic stops, brutalized poor and black folks, and surveilled citizen activists all while demanding increased funding for the expansion of the downtown unit of which you have continued to give them. We know that white socialization, especially when combined with class privilege, often leads white folks to believe that police are here to protect us. We also know who suffers most when we stay silent about these tactics. People of color, indigenous people, working class people, immigrants, disabled people, women, queer and trans people, and social movement activists. It took Chief Hooper just days to initiate intelligence gathering on us and other community members who dared confront the department's violations and seek justice. While it took her six months to initiate an investigation into APD officer Chris Hickman after he brutally beat a resident for the crime of walking home after a 14 hour workday. Enough is enough. We ask here now, who does the Asheville Police Department serve? Who do they protect? At Surge, we know that people of color take risks every day simply by living and moving through the world. In Asheville, we believe in the need for white folks to take risks, even in the face of discomfort, in order to help build the city we want to live in. If we are deemed a threat, we hope that the threat that we are is one, a threat to systemic injustice, inequality, and white supremacy. We remain committed to dismantling white supremacy and any and all barriers to seeking equity and justice. We invite you to join us, and it would be really great if the entire council would speak out against this kind of work as opposed to a few individuals. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> next, next up, um, I have Ellen Perry. Okay. Amy Warthen. Oh. 
My name is Amy Worthen, and I, um, I had written some remarks in support of YTL's proposal, but it sounds like things are moving in the right direction, so I, I don't think I need to read those, but I encourage you to go forward and um, make those significant shifts in how the city uses its property, or, or let's go of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dolores Venable is the last person I have signed up to speak. Good evening, Council, Mayor. Um, once again, my name is Dolores Venable. I'm with Ash for Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm here today because um, I think um, to talk about the um, intelligence gathering, if that's what you like to call it, that was um, initiated by Ash Police Chief Tammy Hooper. Um, first of all, let me just say that um, I'm the administrator of not only Asheville Black Lives Matter as an organization, I administer that Facebook page as well. I can assure you there were no threats posted on that page towards any officer of Asheville Police Department. And if there were such threats put there, I would be the first person to contact Asheville Police Department, as I have always kept first and foremost public safety. Um, I find it incredulous that um, I was the target of such said intelligence gathering. It became to light to me not several days after the murder of Jerry Williams. I was approached by an individual at a public space where we were gathered at who happens to be a retired law enforcement officer who said he had sp spoke with members of Asheville Police Department and had said that he had been told that not only was I being monitored personally, but that I also was being monitored by phone, email, electronic devices, and also social media. On July the 10th of 2016, I put up a Facebook post that said, I know that Asheville Police Department is watching me. I also stated that I would like them for, to stop watching and monitor the family of Jerry Williams. The reason I made that statement was because during that day I had watched Asheville Police Department approach Jerry Williams' family and put stickers on the children of his family members. This very much upset his family after they had been so much traumatized. Over the course, after that um, initial action and the protests and demonstrations that took place here in Asheville following that um, moment, I was um, again approached in um, January, December of 2017. Um, this person approached my mother in a phone call and I told her that not only was I being monitored, but that she was and also Amy Cantrell. At CPAC on March the 7th, I brought this to light. I don't believe that any of you had even heard this before we had said it. That is my honest belief, and I know that you cannot disclose that to the public, but that's my standpoint. With that being said, I want to ask you, how much more do you not know about that has happened with this police chief? I have been very fair. I have been very um, forgiving, to be honest with you, with this chief. I have tried to work with her to build community trust. After what she has disclosed, and after I asked her about this in a public setting at a CPAC meeting, and she bit me and said, no, I know nothing about this. And then go to the newspapers and then twist those uh, comments around and say, well, yeah, we were doing intelligence gathering. There was a very thin line then about what is intelligence gathering and um, surveillance. And to be quite frank with you, um, I don't think that uh, there was a, a, a comment that went out from the police department that said, I don't think the community understands. Oh, yes, they do. We do understand that that was going way beyond what was um, necessary because those actions weren't even taken here in the 70s. Um, do I have um, anybody here to see Tom? Okay. Thank you. Um, to find that out um, was highly traumatic to uh, people who had been working with the police department for two years to collect data to improve the standards of policing to help move Asheville Police Department to a 21st century policing department. We actually went before Kalia when they came here to Asheville when they wanted to reinstate, uh, to recertify Asheville Police Department. We actually spoke and supported that. Please believe me, if we felt any type of contempt for Asheville Police Department, did you think that we would put ourselves in that capacity? I think that some of you have been told a narrative that is not completely true by Asheville Police Department. And over the years we have seen those narratives unfold and now you are seeing another again an untruth that is unfolding before your eyes. Um, one of the other things that tr troubled me about this situation during this time is that the family of Jerry Williams had complained about being harassed by Asheville Police Department. Officers coming to their house for calls that were not made, um, sitting outside of their apartments, their homes, following them in vehicles. You know, was that part of that intelligence gathering? Because if it was, I find that to be borderline of harassment. I find it to be borderline on causing this family more trauma than they already had already been through. Um, it's very disappointing. 
how can I be, or how can I assure my community that it's safe to work with people when they do things like this behind your back? And the fact that you all didn't know about this troubles me as well. Because how much um, authority is this chief taking without your knowledge? Though she has the, 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 the authority to do so, is it the right thing to do? You know, sometimes we have to look at things from a moral or ethical standpoint as well. I find this to be kind of breaching those lines. And the fact that taxpayer money was used to do this and nothing came out of it. And at the same time, Ashton Police Department's own Facebook page had posts from people who were threatening the protesters' lives. They were threatening to run over protesters. They were threatening to shoot protesters. There were some very vividly nasty things on their own social media pages. But they chose to monitor other activists or organization pages, but they weren't even monitoring their own. They weren't even monitoring themselves because if they were, there would be no Chris Hickman's. You know, we need to look at what's real here and be able to um, discern what the narrative should be. And as a victim of this witch hunt, I can tell you, we were not the problem. What's going on before you is that Asheville Police Department is imploding before your eyes. For the last two years since this chief has been in her tenure, we have seen nothing but disaster after disaster come out of APD. Now, I do support police. I don't believe that we can live in an anarchist society. I believe that we must have law and order, but we also must have justice and truth. This is not what we exhibit right now for this city. I ask you all at CPAC, Chief Hooper said that she would resign as she felt that it would do some good. At this point in time, I believe it would do some good. And if she's not willing to resign, I'm asking council to take it upon yourself and use your power to have a closed door session and let's start a search for a new police chief. Because if she did this once, how many other th things has she done or, or what else would she do? Then those numbers that came out about crime statistics and after that went out to the media that I knew for a fact as soon as those statistics were released to the media were absolutely wrong because I was part of that data collection. It took days for that to be corrected. But that's the perception that APD sent out to our communities. And so people base a lot of their support off of these false narratives until people like me come forward. And it took a lot of courage to come forward on March 7th because I knew that you didn't know. I knew that many people didn't know, but the community deserves transparency. And if our police chief was not gonna give it, I believe that it was up to the community to do so. So I guess what I'm coming here today to say is, um, if you wanna build community trust and uh, build uh, relationships, especially with the black community, with police, um, basically, um, using our activists and organizers and community people and, and, and using us against our own, our own people. That's, that's not a great way to do that. She breached a lot of trust within this community when that came to light with the Asheville Citizen Times. Um, and I think it showed people that they really do believe that this department cannot be trusted, especially under her leadership at this time. Um, and to find out that um, we come before you every day, most of you know us on a first name basis as well as Asheville Police Department. We are of no threat to you, but now I feel like this department is a threat to me. How am, I, how am I supposed to move forward with that? How can I ask my organization to move forward with a city that might support this? I don't understand how we, I, I believe that we're at a standstill. Now this has caused a complete standstill of all the work that we've done. I don't want to see Asheville stand still any longer because as long as Asheville stands still, people that look like me die. So I need for Asheville City Council to really take it into your, um, consideration and think about it. what if this was for you because some of you might have been part of this undercover intelligence gathering as well to be quite frank with you so i need for you to think how would you feel to even not know and i understand that people have said that this is stopped but how do we know that how do we know that this is not still going on today should i have to watch behind my shoulder every second i have first amendment rights i have freedom of speech i have the right to, to gather and assemble why was that right even taken into consideration I just asked Asheville City Council to really look at what's going on here and really take a look at the big picture and ask when is enough enough. Thank you. Thank you. I had one more person sign up to speak and that's Reed Thompson. I was sitting at home tonight watching on TV. I had no intentions of coming up here and saying anything. But after hearing about, and I can't even remember the name of the center, and the woman, Linda, I believe was her name, who spoke earlier. Stevens Lee. Libby. Stevens Libby. Lee. Libby. Yeah, Libby. Oh. About Stevens Lee. 
how are we going to spend our dollars? It's crazy. And I came up here to support that. And her experience with the planning and develop, not planning and develop, that's my experience. Her experience with the Parks and Recreation Department. There must be a route that runs deep through this city because I think it's in all of your departments. And you all have the opportunity to hire a new city manager. And we need to get on with it because we have people in departments all over the city that need to be looking for new jobs. I was in a hearing recently where city staff gave false testimony and the city staff person was the lowest person on the pay scale. There were four other city staffers there that were higher on the pay scale and not one of them spoke up to correct the record. So it makes me wonder, what is the record really like in a lot of cases? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else wishing to speak who hasn't waived their time? Yes, Rondo. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Rondell Lance, President of Fraternal Order Police. It's amazing how people can get up here and just say anything, and, and it, it's fact. It's not fact. Most of a lot of you've heard tonight, there's no truth to it, no fact to it. I can't speak on behalf of the actual police department. I don't work there anymore. Uh, but I do know that uh, there's a difference between surveillance and monitoring. Anything you do out in public, anybody can see what you're doing. When you've got a group that I've been threatened by, and some of the people that are in here have threatened me, has said, when he got up to speak, I never wanted to slap a white man so bad in my life. I wish there were some brothers there that could teach him a lesson. And when I'm leaving a meeting, say, you watch your back, something's coming. I didn't report that to the police department because I took it for what it was, just talk. Then you have a group that goes to the police department, blocks public access for the public to get in to do their bidding and you have a group that's blocking traffic, then you have a group that goes to a nonprofit lodge like the Front Order Police, vandalizes our lodge, vandalizes state vehicles, breaks out windows. I, the police department would be negligent in their duty if they didn't monitor a group that's doing, got that type of record. Any group that's out here that we, in my years as the police department that come to town that would block traffic, that would cause chaos, we monitor them. To do more than that, you need a court order, and they never got a court order from my understanding. Anything you put on public media can be looked at and should be looked at. Anything you do out in public <coughs> should be looked at to keep the community safe. The community was uh, when they at the police department when they blocked traffic, especially when they uh, done the damage. It cost us a lot of money at our lodge. Nobody's uh, come to me and said, "Well, that's not us. That's not our group. We're sorry that happened." Nothing. And then to come up and act like they are being targeted, like they are being uh, uh, set in the sights of the actual police officers, that's just not true. The chief has done a great job, and some of the people that's referred to as disseminating information are people that were disseminating information for the purpose of trying to destroy the chief because they don't like who she is, a strong female taking control. And she has made sure that they follow her policy, follow the state laws, and some of the uh, people there do not like that. The men and women that I talk to, the members of the FOP, they strongly support the chief and what she's done. She's tried to work through this. And just remember that when people can get up here and just put out any facts, can say just anything, that doesn't make it true. Uh, chief Hooper is a good chief, one of the best chiefs we've had in a while. If you know her, you know anything about her, it's about doing what's right and then trying to make this community better. And uh, it's just sad when we see that false accusations thrown out. And, and I've been the target of these groups that they're monitoring threatening me myself. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I apologize, I missed uh, our last sign up, Michael Carter. I wanted to briefly have a conversation or just discuss and talk about competency. 
uh, in relation to community relations and uh, working with the police and collaboration. Uh, I think competency is really important and you demonstrate uh, your commitment to change and success by uh, preparing. And when the folks over at the police department released statistics that community members uh, were able to highlight were inflated through simple addition, that was a lack of competency. And then they issued an official statement uh, on Facebook saying that it was a copy and paste error. And I know some of you uh, on this panel have done reporting before and know the importance of competency when you do reporting. And so the fact that it was listed as a copy and paste error in their official statement is in and of itself a demonstration of uh, the level of commitment to transparency and the level of commitment to uh, being just and fair and how the narrative is displayed. So we can talk about uh, issues of surveillance, which I think is, is ethically wrong, you know what I mean? And it's a use of public funds for perceived political purpose. But we have to get at the base issue, which is competency. So when this narrative came out about surveillance uh, and monitoring, uh, the police department should have, one, inherently been proactive uh, in addressing and engaging the narrative because they've been through this before. This, within the past six months, this is the third time we're talking about uh, a community incident in relation to the police in either delay of reporting or misreporting or an inflation of numbers, whether we're talking about the SBI and uh, the incident with Mr. Rush or we're talking about statistics or when we're talking about monitoring, what does it say about our police department that the Asheville Citizen Times is three steps ahead as in terms of uh, crafting and creating the narrative? So I think we need to have constant and consistent conversations around competency. And additionally, you know, some councilmen uh, on this panel have talked about the crime statistics. And if the reporting to WLOS or other community media outlets was so poor recently as far as the crime statistics, doesn't that uh, merit a further investigation of the methodology on how those statistics were uh, messaged out. So I think we need some policies, we need some procedures, and we need some accountability. And I think uh, if we don't have those things, we're going to consistently keep coming back up here. And at this point in time, I think it is uh, not only an issue of community trust, but an issue of competency. Because this is the, this will be the third incident within the past six months that I'm talking about uh, as far as being able to actively on the police department's uh, mindset control or even not even control actively display a commitment to quality community relations either through being transparent or actively reporting information those things need to change it's, it's, it's seriously an issue of competency Um, I don't. All right, we're just we're clapping tonight. Okay, so I don't I don't have anyone else um, signed up to speak. Is there anyone else who hasn't waived their time that would like an opportunity to speak? Thank you, Council Members. Um, Amy Cantrell. I also want to just say how much I admire and respect Libby Kyles, and I'm grateful that you all are hearing her and the need to restore community spaces to the community. Um, there are people that work tirelessly in this community out of love every day. I want to say that I have taken a vow of nonviolence. I believe deeply in the, the way that Gandhi practiced, the way Dr. King practiced, the way Fannie Lou Hamer practiced, tried to walk in the footsteps of these powerful people and these are integral values there are other values like integrity professionalism trustworthiness these are values that we hold deeply in this community and that resonate with many of us i'm deeply disturbed about surveillance intelligence gathering conducted by the Asheville police department recently revealed to the public and thus proving that they lied to the public at the Citizen Police Advisory Committee about doing these things. It is disturbingly unethical. It is a slippery slope constitutionally. It's troubling in a time when APD has deeply fractured their relationship with the community that they would be doing this. This does not create trust, it breaks it. 
It feels like an intimidation tactic being used against community members who have committed themselves to civic engagement, to attending countless city meetings, to being good neighbors, because this is what good neighboring looks like, is being present and standing with our community, to work to end racism and racial disparities and other struggles that we have as a community. Though I do many things out of deep love, this is one of the things that I do out of the deepest love and reverence for all people, and yes, for police officers too. We continue to grow the APD, and yet problems with APD also continue to grow. We have a serious over-policing issue in Asheville, and this is just one example. People who live every day to take care of elders, to promote public transit, to work, to make sure homeless and vulnerable people are taken care of, are also the ones that are targeted in this way. Lawyer and theologian, the late William Stringfellow, says systems that have lost their humanity use tactics like doublespeak and surveillance of citizen community members as tools we must restore the humanity and value system of this department. Swift action needs to be taken by council to call for an end of using these types of repressive tactics. Thank you. Okay, anyone else who has not waived their time? Okay, we have a closed session uh, motion. I move that Asheville City Council go into closed session for the following reasons. To prevent disclosure of information that is privileged and confidential pursuant to the laws of North Carolina or not consider it a public record within meaning of Chapter 132 of the General Statutes, the law that makes information privileged and confidential in North Carolina General Statute 143 through 318 10A3. The statutory authorization is contained in North Carolina General Statute 143 through 318 11A1. To consult with an attorney employed by the city about matters with respect to which the attorney client privilege between the city and its attorney must be preserved, included, including but not limited to a lawsuit involving the following parties, City of Asheville versus T&T Enterprises, City of Asheville versus Parkway Court, LLC. The statutory authorization is contained in North Carolina General Statute 143 through 318, 11A3. Also to establish or to instruct the city staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the city in negotiating the terms of a contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease. The statutory authorization is contained in North Carolina General Statute 143 through 318, 11A5. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor?